Good evening. This lecture is sponsored by Organization Chasde Chaim Leilu Nishmat Baruch Ben Tanchum. Also, Rav Chaim Ben Shalom, Chana Chaya Bat Chaim, Margalit Bat Ichye, and also Refua Shlema, Lealter Tzvi Arya Ben Chana Chaya and Rita Bat Sara. And also, לרפואת תמרה בת נורה, לעילוי נשמת מונירה בת חנה, ורפואה אוף שושנה מלכה בת מעלה רבקה. טוב. ברוך... It's the Tel Avivian, no, no. Soon, soon. No, uh, yeah, yeah. It's against the law now. They, I don't know, they moved it out from this shul. I don't know what's going on here. I thought it's Tel Aviv. No. <laughs> okay, so we are, Baruch Hashem, one day after Yom Kippur. That means we are more righteous than a week ago. Maybe we got... Uh, we got clean from all of our Averos, our sins, hopefully. And uh, now it's uh, day's preparation to the holiday of Sukkot. We don't do any more vidui, you know, until the end of the month, until the end of Tishrei. And the reason for it is because there are, uh, you know, it's first, besides, it's first, it's, pre shh, it's preparation for for the holiday, but at the same time, at the same time, at the same time, the one other reason for the simcha that we have in these four days between uh, Yom Kippur and Sukkot that we don't do Ta'anit, and we don't do your Yorzeit, uh, we, you know, we don't do Tachnun, when the, the, when the Ashkenazim, they don't do Avar Achamin, Lifne Musaf, all of that is because these are days of Hanukkah Tamizbeach in Bet HaMikdash HaRishon. First temple, they made the grand opening of, of the altar in the first temple that King Solomon built. And it's appeared in uh, Kings, Kings A, chapter 8. You can see the celebration over there. So because we are pre preparing now the upcoming Yom Tov, we're busy with the Sukkah, Bat Aminim, all of that. So it's like, a, it's like a mini holiday. This year, there is more room for leniency. You know, every year we buy, we try to buy the best of Bat Aminim. And uh, it's expensive. It's expensive. You can pay hundreds of dollars here in America to buy a perfect set. And uh, sometimes it's even on the border of taking advantage on the people. I mean, I don't know what's their cost and how much they pay for it, but it's not cheap. It's very expensive. But this year, since the first day of Sukkot is Shabbat, so the entire mitzvah is only rabbinical. Because only the first day is the Oraita. We don't have Bet HaMikdash today. So first day is the, the, Oraita, the first day is the Oraita. And Shabbos, we don't do Arbat Aminim. It's Muktzeh on Shabbat. So therefore, for those who are poor, for those who have uh, financial stress, I should say, and it's hard for them, as it is, the preparation. They have few sons. They have to buy, I don't know, five, six, seven sets. Sometimes you need a mortgage for it. This year, because the entire mitzvah does not have the Oraita status, they can be more lenient. However, the rest of the years, you should know, you got to be very careful to buy only Yemenite etrogim. Huh? Every other etrog, it's most likely, from experience, I tell you, I cut them all open after sukkahs. Almost all of them are mixed with lemon. Even if they have very strong ashgachot, cannot rely on it, trust me when I tell you. You open it up, you'll be shocked. You find out that it's mixed with limonim, with lemons. Why? 
all the farmers, the people that have these orchards. How can you tell? You can tell by the, by the, by the look and by the taste. You can see, see, see the tree, uh, and the seeds, oh, and the seeds. Oh, they, they plant this in the tree, in the tree. No, what they do genetically, they mix between the seeds of the etrogim and the lemon, and then they plant a kind, a species that it's already mixture of both. What's the difference? The difference is, if you only grow an etrog, it's much, much, much harder to grow it. Why? Because first it takes 10 times more water. Water costs money, especially in Israel. Even though now it's different times because now they have a machine that cleans all the salt from the ocean, from the water. Water should be cheap. So I don't see the prices went down. Should have been cheap. But you know, in Israel, once the price goes up, usually it never goes down, unfortunately. So what happened is water is expensive. You have thousands of trees. You have to give them water every day. Cost a lot of money, plus the workers. Plus, you have to cover each etrog with a special cover. Why? Because every leaf that falls and touch it makes already some kind of a damage. We call it alim. Even though it doesn't make it pasul, but it takes away from the value. So for instance, if you have a perfect, clean etrog, people can pay $200 for it. Once it has alim on it, price can drop to $30, $40. You know? Now, so automatically, in order for them to make much more money, you have to wrap them. Now, when you have half lemon, it's mixed with lemon, you don't need to wrap, it goes clean, nice, and it needs much less water. There's only one problem, it's not kosher. Minatora, it's not kosher. So that's why, I got, and I once explained why the Yemenite etrogim are the only one that for sure are etrogim, is because the Yemenite farmers were very primitive. The academy did not destroy the Yaman like it destroyed the rest of the world. Like in Europe, every country was destroyed. The academy is the number one enemy of Judaism, of religion in general. Even the fake religions suffer from the academy. Why? Academy hates God, hates religion, hates, you know, uh, alacha. And uh, we can see it in Israel. Look, you can see 100%. You go to the secular court, you go to the universities, they despite anything that smells like religion. It's very interesting. They hate Judaism a lot more than they hate Islam, these liberal Jews. As you can see what they did on Yom Kippur now in Tel Aviv, the Israeli wicked Supreme Court, which is, I repeat, the biggest enemy that the Jewish nation ever had in history. The biggest enemy. It's more dangerous than the Greeks and the Romans and the Babylonians and all those big enemies we had. They are the biggest enemy. Why? Because in their mind they have a mission to destroy Judaism completely, just like the Greeks had. But the Greeks are gone. Now we're dealing with them. They do everything they can to destroy everything, everything that relates to Judaism, the yeshivot, the synagogues. Now they against separation between men and women. They made an order, Erev Yom Kippur, that it's illegal to pray men separately and women separately. Remember two years ago, I was right here warning that we will get to that day, remember? That I said they're gonna send inspectors to synagogues and give fines on Shabbat, why the ladies are upstairs, why the ladies are in the back, why men and women don't sit together. If you remember, I warned from those days, it's right there, the Supreme Court passed the law, it's illegal to divide genders, even though they know it's halacha, they know it's shulchan aruch, they know it's written in the Torah, they can care less. They don't care bichlal, not about Hashem, not about tradition of 3,300 years, they have such ego, they're so evil, they are so wicked, they're such evil people, every one of these 15 judges, that they are the biggest enemies in the history of the Jewish nation of Judaism. They are not the only one, there are hundreds of other judges in Israel that are just as bad. They're waiting for their turn to enter this elite club of these liberal lefty enemies of Hashem, and uh, that, 
every, obviously every, everything that goes to their courtroom, immediately they rule against the Torah, immediately. It's very, very interesting, the hypocrisy that they have. You see, in Israel, supposedly there is a democracy. It's, of course, it's an illusion, there's zero democracy in Israel. It's complete dictatorship. These 15 judges stole the country from the majority of the people. They can care less about them. They do whatever they want, and they can care less that 70% of the people in Israel want Judaism. They don't care. We'll do it our way. You either obey or we'll force you to obey. It's very interesting what happens over there now. Because in one hand, they do not want to pass a law that to teach religion is illegal. They're afraid of the Muslims. There are two million Arabs living in Israel with Israeli ID. They'll burn the country. Plus, they'll kill them. <coughs> they know the limit. They know with the Arabs, you don't mess. You're going to pass laws against laws that will offend the Arabs, the, the Muslims. Not only they're going to burn the country, they will kill each one of us personally. Because Arabs do not take any assault against their religion. If they have to, they'll kill for it. History will teach you. Everyone who say a word against Prophet Muhammad immediately had to go to hide for the rest of his life. Salman Rushdie is a perfect example. After 20 something years, someone just spilled acid in his face and made him I think he lost his ear, you know, something happened to him. He almost died. They never forget. Now what they did in Sweden, Sweden is finished. The Arabs are gonna fight them for the rest of their life. They're never gonna get rid of them. That's it, they're on the blacklist. They go, why? Because they're allowed to burn a Quran in Sweden. The Arabs will never ever forget that. It's not like Jews. The more you torture them, the more they put their head down and accept it. Just like in the Holocaust, we were standing online to go into the gas chambers. There's no such thing to take six million Arabs and put them in lines and tell them, wait until you go into the gas chambers. Because before you even finish the sentence, they'll slaughter you with your children, with your... They're never gonna agree to such thing. There's no such thing to take a nation and put them online to go into, into the burning... Uh, in yeah, gas chambers, right? But we are the, that's the way the Jewish people are. They accepted this horrible tragedy. Of course, it was all from Hashem. Unfortunately, Hashem thought that we deserve to get such thing. But with the Arabs, it's not going to work. So these Supreme Court liberals, they do not want to start a war with the Arabs because they know the Arabs are simply going to kill them. So what do they do? They target only the religious Jews. So now, Jews in Tel Aviv wants to pray, got permit, just like they have gay parades and demonstrations every week. So the Jews wanted to have a Yom Kippur prayers, you know, in, in Tel Aviv. So they say it's illegal to separate between the men and the women. So what did they do? They put Israeli flags. They hung it on a string. Supposedly, it's covering bet between the men and the women. And the men won't be able to see the women. Now came hundreds of, or thousands of lefties. They started to pull the, the, flag. the flags and start to beat up the people. They do not want religion in Tel Aviv. Remember a year ago, I told you, the most wicked city in the world today, it's Tel Aviv. There's no city in the world that is more wicked than Tel Aviv. First of all, it became, unfortunately, the capital city of the gays, which is abomination. The Torah gives death penalty to gays who are active in their sins. And it's not just death penalty, it's stoning and a permanent cut for the soul from the eternal life. So based on the punishment, plus the Torah says clearly that it's toeva, abomination. You know what Hashem thinks about this illegal activity. So it became the capital city of the abomination people. But not only abomination and all these horrible things, it's actually a city who declare a daily war against Hashem and against the al and against Judaism. But one of the guys told them, let's see you going to the Arabs who pray women and men separately 
and try to break into their prayers and tell them it's illegal to separate between men and women. Why don't you ever do it? He asked all these demonstrators. Because you know they will slaughter you. That's why you never even show up there. You only bother nice Jewish people who are not violent. They just came to pray on Yom Kippur. So you know what their answer is? You're a racist. What does it have to do with racism? What does it have to do with racism? Just because it describes what's going to happen to them if they're going to go to the Arabs and tell them, we came to break your prayers. Anyone can do such thing. They tried in France. Did you, did you count how many cars were burned in France since they decided that this burqa is against the law? They burn thousands of cars every day in France. Demonstrations in France, the, the French people are shaking. Why? Right? That's it. There's nothing they can do. Why? They're never going to allow you to attack their Islam, their religion, and their tradition. They'll never allow it. <coughs> if it comes to violence, let it be. But no one will dare to insult our religion and our 1,300 years of tradition. That's why nobody mess with them. Every once in a while you hear some crazy one who try to make a point like burning the Quran now in Sweden, but the consequences are deadly. Remember that newspaper a few years ago that made a, some kind of a fun about, against Muhammad? Well, what country was that? that? In France. In France, they burned the building. They came, there was a, they start, huh? it was a cartoon. A cartoon, some kind of thing. That's why most people in the world do not open their mouth when it comes to Islam. Why? Why should I die? Ah, but Jews, they're never going to make a beep. Let's abuse them, and the more we do, the better it is. And that's the reality right now. You know, so Israel now, it came to a situation that there are two sides. It's like two different nations, the nation of Sodom and the nation of Hashem and there's zero tolerance anymore. There's no, there's no possibility to live together. No possibility. It's just similar to what's happened here in America. The Democrats and the Republicans 30, 40, 50 years ago didn't have so many differences between them. There was, you know, some changes. But most likely they thought about most of the things in the same way. But now the Republicans and the Democrats are so far from each other you have two opposite nations here. People who want religion, people who want Christianity, people who want not to kill, to murder babies, people who are more conservative, and people who are totally wicked, evil, don't care about anything, socialist, you know, anti-God people, lots of atheists, communists, socialists, you call it whatever you want. It's a complete difference. It's very difficult. Here in America, you can divide it to states. Certain states are Republican, certain states are Democrats, like New York and Los Angeles. This is a place with lots of wicked people. But there are other states that the people over there are more pro-religion, even though they follow a fake religion. Christianity is not a religion for Hashem. Too bad for them. But Christianity copied a lot of things from Judaism, from the Torah. So some of the values of the Torah, they adapted, like family values, like <coughs> anti-murdering babies, like more modesty in the way they behave, you know. So it's certain things they took from the Torah. And as a result of that, you can divide America to different states. However, in the state, like here in New York, you have a lot of religious people here, Jews, Muslims, some Christians, but the majority here are obviously liberal, you see. Almost all the Jews here in New York are liberal Jews. Reform, conservative, they all vote automatically Democrats. Same thing in California. The big states, most of the wicked people are going to the big states. Why? That's where the money is. That's where the academy is. That, that's when they have the most universities. Tons of universities, tons of academy. These are the states who hate God the most. That's why their laws are the laws of Sodom. You can see, every one of their laws is the laws of Sodomite laws. 
the pro-gay marriage, pro all kinds of things that God hates. But in other states, there are some states don't even allow abortions. Why? They know it's a murder. You're murdering an innocent baby. What's the reason for it? It's not relevant. Nothing permits to murder a person. The only time that it was permitted to kill a person was in the time of Bet HaMikdash, when we had the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin can rule to execute a person. And the Gemara testify that the, the most uh, strict Sanhedrin executed the person once in 70 years. Meaning other Sanhedrin did not execute anyone. Meaning you can count on one hand how many people were ever executed in history. Sanhedrin together was 830 years. The first temple for, you know, and the second temple, 410 and 420, together 830 years. There were a high court in Jerusalem in the temple of 71 highest, holiest rabbis, include prophets, some of the members were prophets. In 830 years you can count on one or maximum two ends how many people they ever executed. They hardly ever executed a person. Even when the people started to become more wicked and they needed to execute more people by law, they preferred to move the Sanhedrin out of Jerusalem to a different city, Yavne, in order for them technically not to be able to execute anyone. They rather move their location like this. God cannot tell them why he did not execute the wicked. Why? You deal with them. Why should we execute them? And the rule is that you can only execute people that were judged in Jerusalem, in the temple, close to the altar. Because it's written in the Torah, Me'et Mizbachi Tikachenu Lamut. You must take him directly from the altar, from next to the altar, directly to the execution. And the altar is only in the temple, in Bet HaMikdash. Once you move to a different city, there's no altar. If there's no altar, there's nothing you can do about it. You cannot execute someone from a place that there's no altar there. And they did a technical trick. It's a technical trick. And because of that trick, it's, the trick is similar to Prosbol. There was a big Chacham Hillel. He saw that the, the rich people refused to lend money to the poor people. Why? Because they knew in a few months it's going to be Shnat Shmita. Every seven years you have Shnat Shmita. And Shnat Shmita, you do not work in the field. You don't plow, you don't put new seeds, you don't take care of the existing one. There's a lot of restrictions. You let the poor come and take whatever they want for free. You make it have care. However, there's one of the rules is that anyone that you lend money to, once this year comes, the, the bedding is the, is the Jewish court. The be, Jewish court give it to the poor, and the poor person owe the money to the bedding, and the bedding will give you the money. So there's a broker here. Now, the verse is between the rich and the poor directly. But once you put a middleman in between the bedding, it actually eliminates the power of the poor people not to pay to the rich their debt. But the rich have to sign a, a special star, an agreement, it's called prosbol, that you submit the debt into the hand of the bad dean. And they are in charge of it. And to the bad dean, the poor people must pay. If someone didn't make that prosbol, it's a problem after Shnat Shemitah, he cannot collect his debt. So that's another technical, creative, very creative idea to fix a misfortunate situation that happened. Same thing with interest. People want to make interest on their loans. Most people refuse to give loans knowing they won't collect any interest. Besides the risk of losing the principal, especially today that I can say from what I've seen, 80% of the people don't pay their loans unless they have what to lose. When they owe money to the bank, they don't pay the loan. The bank takes away their home and throw them to the street. They do not want to mess with the bank because eventually they'll be on the street. That's if they are in a Republican country, a state. 
if they are in democrat states, it can take forever to evict a person that doesn't pay his mortgage or pays rent. The liberal judges, they rather go against the rich automatically and take the, the people who don't pay their bills, doesn't matter justice, he cannot get him out. He want him out after three years, he doesn't pay his rent, pay him something. Give him $10,000, he will agree to move. <laughs> after three years, he doesn't pay. It's against the Torah. The Torah says you're not allowed to take any sides, rich, poor. You have to judge fairly. Now you see someone in your courtroom that needs financial help, direct him to a place that will help him financially. But he cannot take the sides of the poor because the rich is suing him. Because the rich is right. He's living in his place and doesn't pay rent. It's against the Torah to tell the rich, I'm sorry, you're rich, lose the money. It doesn't work that way. But that's the idea of the Democrats. Always to go by what they feel is right, not by what Hashem feels is right. They can care less what the Torah said. So, then nobody wants to give a loan and not charge interest. So what do they do? They found a creative way. It's called Shtar Heter Iska. What does it mean? I do not give you a loan. I become an investor in your business, a partner. Could be silent partner, could be active partner, doesn't really matter. I'm giving you $100,000, you have to pay me $1,000 a month profit on my investment. Whatever business you conduct, first $1,000 profit that the business generates comes to me. Everything else is yours. If there was no profit at all, you have to come to bed in and swear that there was no profit this particular man. Most people won't want to do it. So like this, you protect it. There are better ways to protect yourself. For instance, you can tell the person, I'm not only your partner in this particular store you're about to open or in this business that you need the loan for. I'm a partner in everything you own, in your real estate, in your house, in your cars, in your other business, everything you own, I'm a partner in it. This hundred thousand doesn't go to the pizza shop you're about to open, because maybe we'll go bankrupt in three months. I am not willing to lose my money, my investment, because I cannot charge, I cannot charge you for the money if the business go down. But if I'm a partner in five different businesses, this one will go down, the next one will go down, the third one will go down, there will still be a partnership in one business that produces profit. And if he lost everything he has, then you lost your investment. And then anyway you cannot collect. Because even if a person took a loan and paid interest and he got wiped out and he doesn't have a penny to his name, nobody can collect anything from him. They don't put people in jail for not paying the debt in America. Israel is a different story. Israel is a different story. In Israel, when you don't pay money, they knock on your door. Jewish banks, they also. They knock on your door, and it's called Otsa'a la Poal. You know what Otsa'a la Poal means? A mafia that works for the government. Very nasty people. <laughs> Boom, 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 they knock on your door, they have a document signed by the court, you didn't pay your debt, and after they start taking, repossessing things from your house. You can take your couches, you can take your laundry machine, you have TV, they take it, whatever they can put their hands on. Not much like a mafia. By the way, it's also against the Torah. The Torah says if you give a loan to someone, you're not allowed to pressure him for the money. Maybe he doesn't have it, but he has a nice house. He may, may have a nice house, but he doesn't have cash. Someone from Great Neck sent me an email before Yom Kippur, between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Persian guy. He told me, Rabbi, do you know how many people live here in Great Neck and they don't have food on their table? It was a, I remember now, it was Erev Rosh Hashanah. Erev Rosh Hashanah, it was Friday. He said to me, they live in houses here in Great Neck because they want to be a part of the community for the show off. But they ask the rabbi quietly if he can get them food for the Yom Tov. They don't have what to put on the, on the table on Rosh Hashanah. We have Avrechim in Monsi. They live in a rented apartment. They don't own anything. Sit and learn Torah. 
ברוך השם, they have what to eat. They learn Torah, they have what to eat. And these people who live in one of the most expensive cities in America do not have money to buy food for Yom Tov. Nothing, not even bread. That's how he described it. So they go, they are in debt, they don't pay the mortgage already for a few months. They're fighting now not to lose their homes. How much people willing to suffer for their ego and for the show off? You know, I don't have to tell you, it's not just expensive, the real estate there. The taxes that you have to pay on a house in Great Neck is more than double than a house in Queens or Brooklyn. More than double. It's very expensive. Some people pay more than $100,000 a year tax on their home. Depends how fancy it is. But I don't think there is less than 30000 there a year. So right there, even if you have a, a lousy house, you pay more than $2,000 a month just taxes. It's like rent. Besides the mortgage. Besides the utility bills. How much they make. If business is struggle for six months, that's it, you're on the street. How much people willing to suffer to make fancy show of weddings? who cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. How we go crazy just for this stupid two, three hour show. And then they cry for it 30 years later. How stupid it was, how we burn all the money on flowers, how we burn the money on the most expensive things and this and that. What did he give us? Where did he get us? Not to talk about that 70% of these marriages end with divorce shortly after. Usually all these fancy schmancy weddings unfortunately end with divorce. This is the generation of the divorce. There is a divorce pandemic. Every three, four minutes I get another message. Can you know anyone who can help us with Shalom Bayit? We separated. Or oh, they're already in the divorce court. Do you know a divorce lawyer? Do you know this, that? It's a pandemic. So, you know, when you don't live in the standards of the Torah and the morality of the Torah and the ethics of the Torah, you destroy yourself in this world before you're going to pay for the next world and the loss you're going to have. In this world, you are already a miserable human being from all the jealousy and the competition and the show off and the emptiness. Look at the rich and famous. Look how much they suffer in their life. Look how much drugs they consume and alcohol and rehabs and this. How can it be? The whole world bow down to them. They're famous. They're millions of fans every day. Sending them so many cards. They know it's all fake. As soon as they collapse, nobody looks at them. Same thing with the bank. They smile to you as long as you bring cash. <laughs> Two or three months you bed and you're already close to the negative, the smiles turns into lousy, angry faces. When you need a little favor, they don't look at you, they don't answer your messages. And you wonder to yourself, wow, 10 years I gave them so much money and they were making money on my money and everyone gave me these fake smiles. Two, three months, business is bad, no money coming in, you're already close to zero, you ask them, give me a, a month or two to cover it, they don't look at you. Come quickly, cover the negative, or we close your account. Your friends, those who gave you hugs when you come to the bank, don't look at you. You come to the bank, they turn their face. Alma de Shikra. All this friendly show of pretending, you know, this, this uh, you know, act that they put together, all these people, all these acts, it's all 100% fake. 100% fake. The Gemara say, the Gemara say, kol ahava shetluya badavar, batel adavar betel ahava. Translation. Every love that is depend on a materialistic thing, beauty, money, convenience, all kinds of things, once that thing dismissed, the love immediately finished, meaning it was really no love. The love was only for the time being. Once that something went away, immediately everything turned around. But real pure love between two individuals, it's not based on anything. 
It's based, I want you, you want me, we want each other, whether we reach, whether we pull, whether we are looking now perfect, and five years later we won't be so perfect, we get all together, all kinds of things like this. But in today's relationship, it's all to begin with is all based on fake reasons. What can he buy me? What kind of house is gonna give me? How many maids I'm gonna have? How many vacations and this and that? Where will I live? You know, all these things. This is the main reason for the marriages today. There's really nothing almost between the people besides desire. It could be physical desire. But there's no time to even develop love because it's all to begin with, what do I get from you? What do you get from me? What are you bringing into the agreement? It's like two partners that open a store. What will you bring into the business? What will you bring into the business? Everyone try to take advantage on the other. And the fights obviously will begin eventually after they open the store and that's how it's going to end. So Abotai, this is now the situation in Israel. Where it's going to end, only Hashem knows. We know based on the prophecies, it's going to be very, very bad. Very, very bad. They are controlling us already 100%. 40 years ago, even 30 years ago, when I started to give lectures, I couldn't say that the lefty liberals, wicked people, controlling us in Israel. No. Uh, control some places. But some other places, it looks like, you know, the right is ever, ever say. But now, there is not one place that they don't control. Now, one place. They control all the courthouses in Israel, including the Supreme Court. They control all the hospitals. They control the union. The union is threatening the government. If you would not surrender to us, we will shut Israel. No airports, no transportation, no hospitals, no nothing. <laughs> they control all the workers. So it's in their hand. All the schools are in their hands. Public school, elementary school, high schools, all the universities are 100% in their hands. All the newspapers are in their hands. There was one newspaper that was a righty that was opened by Sheldon Adelson, this billionaire who died a year ago. It's called Israel Ayom. It was a righty. As soon as Adelson died, he became immediately a lefty newspaper. They were righty because he was the one who gave them all the money. So for him, all these fake reporters pretended to be righties. That once uh, Sheldon Adelson died, immediately the newspaper became also a lefty. Nothing is righty about them. There's one, only one channel in Israel Channel 14, that is Raidi, and everybody fights them to close them down. It owns by a Georgian billionaire, religious one. This billionaire, he lives in Herzliya Pituach, the most expensive neighborhood in Israel. He went to all the stores in Herzliya Pituach that opens on Friday night. You know, he wanted them to close on Shabbat. He said, I'm gonna pay you money for not opening on Shabbat. He paid the money and they agreed to close. What do they care? They get the money without working. Now the left in media found out about it. You have to see what an article they made about it, that he actually went and paid the money to close on Shabbat. They try to make them look bad. I'm giving you money not to open on Shabbat. What do you care? What's illegal here? I can do it, in, I can go to any store and say, how much you make every Friday to, to, to Saturday night? $5,000. Every we come to me, I'll give you $5,000, close the store. What's not legal here? When the lefties want to make it look bad, they know how to do it. So they control everything. They control the army, they control the police, they control everything. Trust me when I tell you, you do not find one major company that they don't control. They control the electric company, the water company, the airlines, everything is in their hands. El Al Israeli airline was bought by a religious man from Monsi. A religious man is not supposed to be a lefty. But the pilots of El Al, not one of them agreed to fly Netanyahu to Washington, to New York, sorry. They couldn't find a pilot until a few days before the flight. None of the pilots agreed to fly. Why? Because it runs by lefties. He bought a company, but they can care less who he is. 
they run it their way. And if he's going to start fighting with them, they shut the company. They make a strike. They have thousands of flies every, uh, flights every week. What are you going to do? You're going to start a war with the pilots? They are all lefties. You cannot find pilots that are righties. They're all lefties. All the academic people, almost all of them are lefty liberal haters of Hashem. Why? Because from day one they were brainwashed by the academy. And because of that, this is the, that's the product of what they do. And everything I just told you, it's written in one page in the Zohar. That that's the, going to be the situation before the Mashiach would come. That they will control us 100%. So we're going to suffer from them X amount of years. We're already in their hands for about 30 years or more. Who knows how many more years we have to suffer with them. They, it's only going to get worse. They're going to come to synagogue. They won't let us pray. They're going to ruin the davening on Shabbatot. Everywhere. Not just in Tel Aviv. We are going to days much like the Greeks. Remember, everything I say a few years ago happened already. And what I tell you now is just a matter of time because the more confidence they get, the more they try to hurt. And they're going to make fines. Why uh, women are sitting up there? You get $10,000, 10,000 shekel fine. Next Shabbat will come here if the women and the men will not be mixed, we'll shut you down. We'll make a court order. We go to the Supreme Court. It's against the law. There's only one thing and I'll move on. Uh, if you can ask him to be quiet. Uh, so there's one thing, and I will conclude with that. In Israel, as of now, it's still legal to teach Torah. I, I repeat, it's still, the highlight on the word still, it's still legal, it's meaning it's not against the law to teach Torah. Meaning if you have a yeshiva, you, they can still not arrest you for teaching Torah like the Romans did and the Greeks. So far, according to the law, they allow you to have a synagogue. They allow you to have a yeshiva. They allow you to come and give a lecture to your followers. They allow it. So far, yet. However, they also have a law that you're not allowed to sue a person that quote from religious books. Like if someone says something from the Talmud, they don't like it, obviously the liberals, because it's against their ideology. But if you say it in the name of Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, or Rabbi Akiva, or Moshe Rabbeinu, or it's from the Torah, or in the name of the Rambam, or Shulchan Aruch, they cannot sue you for quoting from religious books. Same thing Quran, same thing Christianity, and other religions. Freedom of religion, that was the declaration of independence in Israel. That is freedom of religion, and one of the laws is that if you say something in the name of the Rambam, and they want to sue you for that, they can't. That's what's written. In reality, they destroy you. They sue you, they penalize you, they call you for investigation, they torture you mentally. They search in your computer, they search in your phones, they do all kinds of things. Why? They can do whatever they want. They don't care about the law. So for instance, i give you one example from me. I went to the court, the former prime minister is suing me, so I say he's not Jewish. I brought a document from the United States that shows every person who was born in San Francisco, that's where his mother was born. 1965, she got married. It shows that next to her name, Christian Baptist. It's not me, I didn't invent it. It's a public information, it's an index to show everyone was born in America. I bring it to the liberal judge. He already came as my enemy. Before we even sat down in the court, he already saw that he came already very, very angry because obviously when he found out that he's going to be the judge in my case, he went to check who, who I am on YouTube. And he's a, an extreme liberal like Bernie Sanders, and he knows how much I hate those liberals, and I speak about it f openly in my lectures. And immediately I became his enemy, because don't expect justice. So every, everything I wanted to say immediately dis dismissed. I don't know how reliable it is. So it's, a, it's a public index. People pay money. It's membership. You're lawyers to get information from there. 
you know, and I said, okay, why don't you ask her to bring any proof that she's Jewish? She doesn't have, we're waiting for it more than three months. We kept asking, show us one document, I'll publish an apology. She doesn't have any record that she's Jewish. I have, from the United States, her birth is Christian Baptist, and I'm losing, and I'm forced to pay her compensation. I'm forced. Why? Because the judge hates me, he doesn't care. And plus he kisses up to the, to the liberal <laughs> prime minister that took 200,000 votes to the left. Could, could the rabbi ask for a different judge? No, there's no way to ask for a different judge. My car? Where is Benji? Benji, move the car. Thank you. So, uh, to make a long story short, now I am in the court. I say, oh, well, I have a... I, I, I heard rumors everywhere, everybody spoke about it. For whatever reason, from tens of thousands of people who published it in their Facebook pages and WhatsApp groups and all over, he decided to sue me. Why is it? Because you're popular and you made the most danger. That's what he said. I said, but everyone already spoke about it. It's not that I made something new, that everyone heard about it already. It's not something, a rumor that nobody knew about. So the damage was there and he didn't say anything for a year. Why after a year all of a sudden to find a victim and sue him? Why? Because no one took it serious until you spoke about it. Once you spoke about it, my mother started to get phone calls. We didn't know you were not Jewish. We didn't know you're not, you know, you're born not Jewish. So that's what got him, the ego that people call them up. So anyway, after all of that, you know, so the judge said to me, you can go to trial, but you're going to deal with the consequences of it. And he's telling me, I'm going to give you the whole million. Better you surrender now and pay a fine, publish an apology in this. So I said to the judge, in this country, you're still allowed to teach Torah. It's not against the law. And if someone brings a, a Jewish source to back up his, uh, his, his speech, you, you're not allowed to sue him. That's the law in, in, in Israel. So what are you saying, I said to the judge, that if I will quote the Rambam on Shulchan Aruch that every Mechalel Shabbat count like a non-Jew, according to the Jewish law. So are you saying that 80% of the Israelis that are not Shomer Shabbat will be able now to sue me and I'm gonna have to pay each one of them 100,000 shekel compensation because I say what the, Jew, the halacha is? Now you know I learned body language. It took the judge 10 seconds to understand what I was telling him. Because until that moment, they don't know anything about Torah, these judges. Remember, this is Tel Aviv, lefty, never in his life heard a speech. So now, it took him 10 seconds to digest what I just told him that according to the Torah and the Shulchan Aruch, Mechalel Shabbat is also like a goy. Meaning he's a goy. And my lawyer caught it. And he started to scream, Lo relevanti. It's not relevant! It's not relevant! Continue! Rabbi, continue! Why? Because he saw that the judge is about to jump and, and choke me. <laughs> Why? M meaning, it's such an absurd. They do nothing Jewish in their life, but if someone tells him you're not Jewish, they're willing to kill him. And that brings me to what I wanted to say. Listen carefully. Until 150 years ago, all the Jews in every country, from the day we got the Torah, until 150 years ago, it really started 230 years ago, in the time of Moshe Mendelssohn, that we started to go to universities and leave Hashem and leave the Torah and all of that. But, but, when it really, really already became a problem, it was 150 years ago. Until 150 years ago, all Jews in the world, their life was around Judaism. Meaning, some were not religious. Some left the religion, some didn't keep Shabbat, some didn't eat kosher. But everybody knew 
in order for you to be called a Jew, there are conditions. Meaning Judaism has to be the center of the life of the Jewish people. Even when they started the Israeli state by all communist, anti-religion people like David Ben-Gurion and his friends, in the Declaration of Independence, they call it Jewish Democratic State. They didn't call it Democratic State, Jewish Democratic State. In the United States, it doesn't say Christian Democratic State. It's a state to all the religions. If you come in America and you say Christian Democratic country, it's against the law. It's racism. Why you say Christian? What about Jews? What about Muslims? What about Hindus? But in Israel, those liberals, Ben Gurion and all his friends were all eating non-kosher. They were all Mechalelei Shabbat. They were all haters of Torah. But they agree in the declaration to say that Israel will be a Jewish state will give freedom to other religions, but the main religion of Israel will be Judaism, even though they kept nothing from Judaism. But they know if you take out the Jew, Jewish out of the equation, there is no justification to build a state in the Holy Land. Because the only reason we came to Israel is because of the Torah. Now, in the last two, three generations, there is a whole concept of Judaism. What does it mean? They invented the term that you can be Jewish even if you have zero connection to Judaism. Zero, literally. Now one mitzvah, you don't have mezuzah, no brit milah to your children, no Shabbat, you don't keep the holidays according to the Torah, you don't fast on Yom Kippur, you are against yeshivas, you're against synagogues. You are pro-gay, you are pro-gay marriage, you are pro-assimilation, meaning you have zero Judaism in you, and you get angry when someone tells you you're not Jewish. <laughs> you understand what's happening here? Not only you get angry, you have the right to sue. <laughs> and then you ask him, I don't understand, can you tell me what makes you Jewish? <laughs> I live in Israel. The Arabs also live in Israel. What makes you Jewish? You don't keep anything. The Arabs keep more of the laws of the Torah than these liberals. Arabs. Arabs don't eat pork. They don't eat pork. The liberals eat pork as much as you bring them. Supply them with pork every day for free, they'll eat only pork. No problem. The Arabs don't charge interest. <laughs> they charge interest. Some of the laws the Arabs do, it's more religious than them. So they say, I'm Jewish. What Jewish about you? What, give one proof that you're Jewish. What's the connection between you to Judaism? We define our own Judaism. We decide what's Jewish. No problem. I'll go with your definition. Define. Uh, we live in Israel, the Arabs also. So, so, so what, the Arabs are also Jewish? Also, we went to the army. The Druzim also go to the army. So the Druzim are Jewish? Uh, they think. Uh, so what, so what, what's Jewish about me? Really, they don't have no answer. Zero, they can't find an answer. But if you tell them you're not Jewish, they want to kill you. One of them say once in the Knesset, Ani Yehudi, Beramach Evarai Veshasagidai. I'm Jewish in my 248 organs and 365 ligaments. Someone from the religious people asked him, Do you even know what it means, Ramach Evarai Veshasagidai? He had no idea. He had no idea what he's saying. He just heard that someone saying it. He didn't even know what it means, Ramach. Resh Mem Chet, meaning 248. They don't know, they know numbers. Two, four, and eight. They don't know Resh Mem Chet. They don't know how to translate Resh. Resh is 200. They don't know. They're so ignorant. You have to understand, you have judges sitting in a court in Israel. The chairman of the Supreme Court did not know how to say Shema Israel Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. 
The Chabadnik had to say to him word by word. And then he said, I never learned Judaism in my entire life. He's in his 90s. He is the one who destroyed Israel completely. He is the main dictator who made Israel a state of Goim. He admitted. The guy asked him, the reporter, Israel is supposed to be Jewish democratic state. Which one of the two? It's you. The democratic or the Jewish? He said the democratic. What about the Jewish? I'm very sorry. I have, I have zero knowledge in Judaism. Zero knowledge in Judaism. That means this moron never even opened the Rambam once in his life to read. Or Shulchan Aruch. Or the Chumash. Now once in his life he read Parashat Shavua. And he's the head of the Supreme Court who dedicated his life to destroy Judaism. And he doesn't know what it is. And he admits. The biggest absurd is that now is the guy puts tefillin on him and tell him, repeat after me. And a second later, he asks him, you believe in God? Absolutely not. So why you put tefillin, you idiot? Why do you put tefillin on? If you don't believe in God, why you put mezuzah in your house? And he's so confused. And these are the people who decide who would live, who would die, who would stay in his home, who will be thrown to the street, who will pay fines, who will be, they are the ones who make such an absurd. And all of that it's written in the Holy Zohar 2,000 years ago. Now remember when it was written, who would ever dream that the government, the authorities, will all be wicked people who hate Hashem? Who would ever dream such thing 2,000 years ago? You didn't have secular people back then. Even those who are not fully righteous, who would ever dream that they'll dedicate their life to destroy the Torah? The Zohar wrote it, that that's exactly what's going to happen to us before the end of days. After the struggle and all the sufferings, it will have an happy end. If you can call it happy, it's also questionable. After there will be a massive war, Gog and Magog, all the wicked people will die. There will be a period, a period that the Messiah would come from the Olive Mountain, Aras 18, will go down to the Western Wall, to the Kotel. There will be obviously noise all, all over the world in today's world with the communication we have. And all the souls of the Erev Rav, those Egyptians that Moshe Rabbeinu adopted and brought them out of Egypt, they are the ones who constantly reincarnate and give us all the problems. They will all gather together as the last attempt to go and prevent the Messiah from fulfilling his mission. And unfortunately, he will start saying all kinds of verses and all of them will go on fire. That's what the Zohar says. They will all be burned alive. If we will be in the world in that time, I doubt it very much. Some of us are not righteous. Not, not Shomrei Shabbat, don't learn Torah, don't live according, women are not modest. We're not going to have the schut. Those who will be righteous, we may die before that. So we will have to resurrect after that. After the Mashiach comes, there will be a period of resurrection of the dead. We may not be in the world when it happens. Maybe it will happen in our days. Some of you are very young. There's a very high chance that you'll still be at that day when it happened. You will hear the siren, the shofar of Eliyahu Navi all over the world. You know, by the way, until today there are places, every time Hashem chose a different city, and they hear voices of shofar from heaven. Loud! City of hundreds of thousands of people. Everybody looks up, where does it come from? Loud shofar. Just yesterday someone sent me a video. Voices of shofar are still heard, heard in different cities in the world. Ukraine, Russia, United States, Israel, all different places. Nobody knows where it comes from. Real voices of shofar. 100% you recognize it shofar. Mamash like Tkiya, Truam, all these things that we have. Why? Hashem probably is giving us hints 
soon it's coming, soon. You know, the Gemara says, three things come by surprise in the life of a person. One, a scorpion. You went camping, you lay somewhere in a forest or in a desert. Uh, uh, what? Scorpion. Scorpion, yeah. A huh? A curve. A curve, yeah. A deadly scorpion. I think the yellow one is the deadliest, or the black one, I don't know. They come, psh, sting you. From the minute you realize, that's it. You know, you have two or three hours and you finished. Scorpion, by the time you recognize he came in contact with you, it's. Yeah, it gadal vit kadash merabah. Other thing that comes by surprise is finding a lost object. You walk in the street, diamond ring on the floor. Big surprise. Wow, diamond. Or oh, staff of cash fell from someone's pocket. See, $2,000 folding like this on the floor. You pick it up, wow. A month of work just came in a second. And the third one is Mashiach. I will catch you by surprise. One of you will be snowing, the other one will be in a bathroom, one will be in the middle of learning, one will be walking on the street, one will be on the bus, one will be in a plane. Everyone will be somewhere. All of a sudden you hear a very loud shofar. Most people obviously won't know what it is about and never learn Torah. Everybody asks, what's this? Do you know what's going on? Yeah, yeah. It comes from Jerusalem. So the question is, where will you be when it happens? I want to ask you a question. These are the only three things that come by surprise? I can give you a million things that come by surprise. They just offer you shidduch after 10 years. Big surprise. <laughs> 10 years, the phone never rang. Boom. Today the Shatran called. I actually have someone very good for you. Big surprise. Metziah. Uh, you got a, a check from the IRS. We calculated five years ago, you pay extra money. We're giving you back $5,000. Big surprise. No? No, I want you There's a lot of interesting things that may come by surprise. Accident. All kinds of things. So why the Gemara only gave three things? Three things come by surprise. Obviously, it's the, the, it's the words of the smartest people ever live. Everything is extremely deep. Every word in their mouth is extremely, extremely deep. You have to break your head to understand why they say it and why like that. So the answer is, when the Mashiach would come, for some people it will be a scorpion, deadly scorpion, and for some people it will be like finding a treasure. Depend who you are. If you are Michalel Shabbat, it's a scorpion. If you are gay, it's a scorpion for you. If you're a liberal lefty hater of Hashem, it's a scorpion for you. If you Shomer Shabbat, Talmid Yeshiva, Tzadi, comes to shul, comes to, to lectures, keeping mitzvot, eating kosher, it's a, it's a treasure for you. From now on, everything will become wonderful. That's it! No more anti-Semitism, no more Nazis, no more Hamas, no more Liberals, no more none of this headache. Finally, the world will be purified. That's what we say every day, three times. Letaken olam bemalchut shadai. Lafnot elecha kol rishi aretz. All the wicked people will be turned into Hashem. They will get their guilty verdict. The world will be finally purified. Some of these modern Orthodox liberals, some of them are very, very lefty. I still work with the Amaka, I don't know why. They say it three times a day when they come to, to, Min, to Minyan. They come to their modern shuls, conservative, modern, whatever they are. And they say, They talk about themselves, against themselves. They don't even know. They don't understand even what they say. They daven Tfilat Shmona Yisrael every day three times, no? Religious, no? What do they say in Tfilat? Laminim u lamanshinim al ti tikva. Chol hazedim kerega yovedu. They are wishing eternal instant death upon themselves. 
and I don't even know. They don't, I promise you, now one of them understand what he says in Tefillat Shemona Esre. Ask one of them with those little leather yamaka, size of a quarter, excuse me, Mr. Jew, <laughs> can I ask you a question? Do you just say that you were a chazan, right? You had the yard site, so you were davening in front of the Amud. You just say laminim, can you explain to me what it means? He has no idea. Now after you tell him, he may never agree to daven anymore. It's a big risk. Because he's actually praying that Hashem will destroy him. It's a criminal lawyer in a, in a criminal court, prosecuting innocent Jews according to the laws of the goyim. It's a very, very big sin. So he is the minimum of Hashinim. He's a moiser. La minim ve la malshinim alti tikva ve chol hazedim kerega yovedu. Some people don't know how to read Hebrew, they say karega. What's the difference between karega and kerega? Tiny difference, or maybe a big difference. Karega means right now they should be destroyed. You don't tell Hashem what to do. Hashem, I want them destroyed now. You're not giving orders to Hashem. You can say karega. You say karega. When you will decide to destroy them, it will be instantly. It won't take more than a few seconds. It won't be a process of years. Pshht. And one minute and it's over. That's the prayers of Chazal. I didn't write it. Yeah. What do we say in the Tfila? In Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. Lavir Memshelet Zadon Min Aretz. To destroy the wicked government from the land. Do you know one righteous government we had since Israel became a state? Almost everyone Chalet Shabbat. Almost everyone eats not kosher. Almost everyone fought the yeshivot. Of almost everyone today now is pro-gay, almost everyone is pro-Hamas, almost everyone is hating Judaism, hating religious people. The entire uh, com commercials on TV before the election was give us the power to destroy the Haredim. Every one of them. They don't talk about any other topics. Just against the Haredim. Gantz against the Haredim. Lapid against the Haredim. Lieberman against the Haredim. Meretz against the Haredim. Avoda against the Haredim. Nothing else. There's no more Iran. There is no more economy issues. There are more, no more all kinds of other problems. Nothing. Haredim, Haredim, Haredim. Haredim means ultra-Orthodox people. All the commercials was help us to destroy the religion. And the will go. Hmm? And the will go. Yeah. So you have to take the Haredim, put them on a wheelbarrow, and throw them to the garbage uh, where, they, the, where they dump the garbage and burn it. What's the name of it? Ah, sanitation? Incinerator. Incinerator, but the big ones. You know where all the garbage of the town goes to? That's what they say on TV. It's time to put the Haredim together with Netanyahu in a wheelbarrow and dump them in a dumpster, meaning to burn them over there, like with the garbage. On open TV, not in some hidden uh, living room, in front of the whole world. So that's where we are now. It's very bad, I know, very discouraging, very depressing, but it will have a happy end. The question is, where are we going to be when, it, when that happy end will come? Will we survive to see it? Or maybe we're not better than them. Maybe we're not liberals. Maybe we don't hate Torah. Maybe we don't hate Hashem. Maybe we love Hashem. Everything is true. But maybe we are Mechalel Shabbat. There are a lot of uh, traditional people. Kiss Mezuzah and Mechalel Shabbat. Kiss mezuzah and eat treif. Eat non-kosher in the house. Buy meat in places that is not kosher. Have mezuzah in the home, put fill in, and have a non-Jewish girlfriend. That's also very common. Putting mezuzah in the house, putting fill in, eating kosher only, and living with his wife without mikveh. Karet every day almost. Every time they intimately together, it's a cut for the soul. Permanent cut. Unfortunately, it is what it is. Some traditional people now, out of lack of knowledge, they watch movies on Yom Kippur. 
הוא אמר, we fasting, רבי, we fasting, we're not going. What do you do in a fast? We're watching TV. They have channels now from all over the world. So they watch. This is a Yom Kippur, ואיניתם את נפשותיכם, to sit and watch movies, comedy. Zero knowledge. So the question is, where are we going to be? If we already passed, let's hope we will be in heaven. Heaven is a temporary place that restores our souls until the resurrection of the dead. Why is someone that is already in heaven would like to come back to this filthy world? Do you want to replace heaven with this world? You're out of your mind? The answer is absolutely not. So this is an upgrade or a downgrade? Someone that is heaven, in heaven and he's forced to come back to this world. It's an upgrade or it's a downgrade? downgrade. Today, absolutely a downgrade. But after Mashiach would come, it will be the greatest upgrade. Why? Because the world will not be the world we are in. It's not going to be all the field here. It's not going to be all the wicked people here. Plus, there's not going to be wars anymore. It will be only, uh, only righteous Gentiles survive. That's it. Those who love God, those who are not anti-Semite, those who are not murderers or thieves or any of those. So uh, how many, I don't know, maybe a few hundred millions go in. They are righteous Gentiles, meaning they keep the seven laws of Noah and they are decent people. They will survive. Wasn't the mitzvah get bigger when times are worse? Like in Noah, he got saved because he was a sadiq in that kind of time. So if he come, if someone comes down to heaven this world, they basically have a bigger zechut than Gadol in 500 years ago. Are much Today it's, it's much harder to keep mitzvot, but at the same time it's much, much easier to learn Torah today. Today you have everything, you click on buttons, everything is right to your face with explanation, all the books with English translation. It's the easiest it's ever been. Even dumb people today can learn and understand Torah, which they couldn't 30, 40 years ago. Before the revolution of the internet and all the media we have today and USBs and all of that, do you know how difficult it was to learn Torah? The only way to learn Torah is to go to yeshiva and sit with someone to teach you. Today, they have art scrolls explaining the whole Gemara. You can understand 80% of it by yourself because they explain everything in simple English. Plus, you have Daf Yomi in English. He explained to you everything. You have to be super dumb not to understand. He explained to you everything. You don't really need to break your head. So today it's much easier. Plus today, you have few, still few speakers in the world who speaks and inspire you, and all you have to do is sit home and click a button. You never had it before. So yes, today on one hand, the world is filthy, and it's very difficult to be righteous when you're surrounded by so many wicked people. It's true. Therefore, if you're already righteous, it counts like a very big thing, 100%. However, because the situation is like this, Hashem also gave us books. 50 years ago, he didn't have books. Do you know, not 50, 100 years ago, people still write books with their hands. There was no print like today. You come, you buy a book, $20, and you have everything you need. You didn't have books. A few hundred years ago, people would write books with a feather. To have a book of Rambam, it was a scroll like a Sefer Torah, only the rabbi of the city had. Not always. It was impossible to have books. Do you know, the Yemenites, in Yemen, it was the most primitive place. When they read in the Torah, they say one verse, and then they say Targum. Targum. Targum means translation. Why? They don't, they don't have chumashim. They don't have printing. They say a verse and they explain the meaning of the verse to the people. Until today, they have this custom. You understand why? Because there was no books. Uh, Mordechai Sharabi Zatzal, a very big Kabbalist, Yemenite, was a huge Talmud Chacham, holy person. He was Rosh Yeshivat Amkubalim, Nahar Shalom. It's in Machne uh, Yehuda, in uh, Agrifas. Agrifas, where all the tourists likes to go. They have yeshiva of the Kabbalist. He is the one who was the Rosh Yeshiva. He used to teach Gemara without the Gemara. 
because he grew up in his, like maybe in Yaman, in China, in his childhood, that they were used to teach and to learn without an open Gemara, because there was no Gemara printing in Yaman a hundred years ago. Where would you get a Gemara like we have today? Everything is printed nicely with Rashi. So he was able to teach them Gemara that he learned as a child without having the Gemara, meaning he knows the whole page by heart. Some Syrians are like that. Some old Syrians in their late 80s, 90s, that learned Torah in Syria 80, 90 years ago, they can tell you every Aftarah by heart. They learn in Chalab over there. What do you think? They had, uh, they had printed books like we have today? It was a whole different world. So today, yes. On one hand, you are right. On the other hand, you are wrong. Hashem always balanced the free will. It gets harder, but at the same time, there's more resistance. You can become Baal Tshuva today with one lecture like this tonight. person listened to this. So, wow, I live in a dream. I'm Chalel Shabbat. If Mashiach comes tomorrow, I'm finished. That's it. In one second, he wakes up. I just had an interview now in Israel with a very famous celebrity in TV. His name is Yaron Ilan. He's the host of all the music entertainment shows. And he, you know, every singer goes to his show. He's very famous. A few months ago, he had a massive heart attack. Barely made it. He almost died. It's not, in my opinion, he's not even 60. Maybe he's around 60 years old. He almost died. And what happened? He started to get interested in religion because he was already between life and death. So now every week he made an interview with a different famous rabbi. So he made like two or three before me. I happened to be in Israel. He, his people ask if they can interview me. I say yes. I sat with him for about 45 minutes. And you should watch, if you know Hebrew, you must watch it. It's a very good interview. It made a very big impact on a lot of people and on him as well. He said to me, you leave no choice to a person. <laughs> so the other ones were very soft. You know, I went, I went home speaking to them, actually feeling good with myself. I fell to your head. You, you left me no choice. I must become religious. Why? Because that's the right way to teach Torah. To tell people what's written, not what you feel like. Not what you want them to hear. What you have to teach what's written. All these famous celebrity speakers who promise people the world will have to be judged for all their false promises. Who nominate them to promise the wicked people heaven? To promise them Olam Abba when it's against Shulchan Aruch, against the Rambam, against the Zohar, against the Gemara, against Chazal, against the Chumash. Where did they find it? I never saw anywhere in the Torah that the wicked people will have a share to the world to come. In the Talmud I learned, in Masechet Sanhedrin, it says clearly, there are many Jews who lost their share to the world to come. And anyone who does public sins with no shame in public, meaning Mechalel Shabbat Befaresia, already lost its share to the world to come. That's what the Mishnah in Sanhedrin said. Ve'ele she'en la'em chelek la'olam haba. And it brings a list of wicked Jews. And the most wicked are the Mechalelei Shabbat. Mechalelei Shabbat and gays have the worst punishment in the Torah. Much worse than a murderer. The murderer is much less in his wickedness. It's also that penalty, but there's no permanent cut for his soul. A murderer doesn't have karet. Chalel Shaban have karet. Someone who lives with his wife without mikveh has karet. A murderer doesn't have karet. Someone that eats chametz and Pesach has karet. A murderer does not have karet. So think about it. Someone who drink beer in, a, in Tel Aviv, in a bar, all these hippies, full of tattoos with their ponytail sitting, like Goim, drinking beer, if you come and say to them, you know what you are doing right now, has a bigger punishment than the punishment of a murderer. They laugh at you. They think you're not known. They say, go, go, you're crazy, get out of here. You can't even tell them that. They would make a joke out of you. Why in the, the wildest dream, they don't even understand that eating chametz and Pesach 
have such a horrible punishment because they don't even know what Pesach is for. They even never even heard about the Exodus of Egypt. They don't know the story of Yitziat Mitzrayim. They don't know anything. Ask them who's Paro, they don't know. Ask them who's Moshe Rabbeinu, most of them don't know. Ask them who's Noach. 90% of the Chilonim don't know who is Noach. Go in Tel Aviv. Stop a million secular people. Ask them, do you know who's Noach? 20% may know. Maximum. I met some kibbutznikim in the past, 30, 25 years ago, which was not as bad as today. They had some knowledge back then. Today, zero knowledge. But back then, they still learned a little bit Torah. They didn't know who's Noach. I had a kibbutznik in Little Neck, car wash here in Little Neck. When he heard me speaking to another Israeli guy from the side, he didn't know who Noach is. He didn't know about Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. He heard me speaking to him about a lecture that I'm giving in Queens. I asked me, what's the topic? I said, life after death. That's when he came into the conversation and he said, you believe this nonsense? I said, what? He said that there's life after death? I said, no, I don't believe. So how can you give a speech about something you, don't, you yourself don't believe in? I say, that's exactly it. I don't believe in it. I know 100% there is life after death. <laughs> Believing means not knowing. I know 100% that it, there is life. Ah, how can you know? Anyone came back from there? You know, they all, they all have the same questions. Everyone has the same. Mishu Chazar Misham. Anyone came back from there? I say, yeah, 30 million people came back from there. Where? How come I never heard about it? There are many things you never heard about it. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Come to the lecture tonight. You'll get your proofs. I'm working night shift. I can't. So I saw he's thirsty to hear. All I had is Mesilat Yesharim. This was 25 years ago. I wasn't equipped like today. USBs, books. So I had one book by me, Mesilat Yesharim, of the Ramchal. I saw this guy's kibbutz, Nick, kibbutz Bet Hashita, where you buy all the pickles from, all the cans, you see, Bet Hashita, that's their kibbutz. I say, you know what, let me give him this book. I gave him the, the Mesilat Yesharim, three days, I gave him my card. Three days later, he called me, screaming, having tears on the phone. How can it be that, that they don't teach these things in the schools in Israel? For three days, I'm, 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 I'm my, my soul, I'm... So can you make a lecture to all your friends? I'll come in Manhattan. They all live in one building. It's a chain of car wash. The owner of the car wash bought the building, 92nd Street and 1st Avenue. There was four floors. Each floor, I think, had two apartments. So all of them lives there. Gather all of them into the apartment and I come. I say, yeah, will you come? I say, yeah. I went there, there was more than 30 guys and girls, all from kibbutzim. He wanted to hire people from kibbutzim. <laughs> so what happened? The walls were purple. All of them were smoking grass, so I couldn't even really see besides smoke, nothing. And plus they had birds flying in a room, birds, you know? <laughs> those, those singing birds flying in a room, one from my rear. This is the atmosphere of the lecture. So, for three hours, I gave them so many scientific proof the Torah is divine. And all they were doing, just like the lefties in Tel Aviv now, in Yom Kippur, screaming, Amos, don't leave us. Don't, de don't let this primitive guy kidnap you. <laughs> you had to see. After three hours, he got up. He said, it's amazing. I always thought, wow, what great friends I have. For three hours, I didn't, he didn't know all the proofs. He only read Mislat Yisharim. He never saw proofs that the Torah is divine. It's the first time from the side he's watching the entire thing. And he said to them, I cannot believe he gave you so many proofs. I'm shocked from the proofs. How can you even argue? You don't even listen. All you came here for is to scream and demonstrate. None of you even heard a word of what he said. I'm ashamed to have such loser friends like you. <laughs> I'm ashamed. Needless to say, a month later, he was already in the great yeshiva in Bnei Brak, Netivot Olam. 
six months later already had a beard, seeding, learning Mara, a pure Nejama. He was not a Rev Rav, and there were Erev Rav, there's nothing you can do about it. You speak to an Erev Rav, a year, Vivre Torah, and proofs, he will not become religious. That's one of the ways to tell. There are some lefty liberals that are simply ignorant. They're not evil. Once you begin to have a conversation with them, you find some decency. They ask, they answer, they agree, disagree, but they have a conversation with you. And you see, after an hour, two, three, they're beginning to open up their eyes. Wow, I didn't know about this. So you see there's someone to talk to. Then you know it's a Jewish soul. But then there are people, you're going to give them 1,000 proofs that nobody can argue, scientifically. No one. The fish, the stars, the vitamin K, one after the other. After 10 hours, not only they're not becoming already opening their mind and heart to observe some holiness, they become bigger haters. You see more evilness in their eyes. That's when you know they are the Erev Rav. Impossible. Especially even Goim would be there. Goim. Complete Goim. The Goim will become religious. The Goim says, Rabbi, can I convert? <laughs> I was in Mexico. I spoke, and there, there was one Rabbi, Rabbi Cohen there, that, that you know, they have he earpiece. Not everyone speaks English. So there was one rabbi, no, actually I spoke in Hebrew, and he was translating from Hebrew to Spanish. So he has a booth, booth, he, with a microphone, he hears me, and he speaks, and everybody hears me in Spanish. So he speaks Spanish. I see the janitor of the shul, a guy that works there in the shul for years. I see... He stands like this with his ear for two hours next to that rabbi in a booth, like this. He didn't move for two hours like this. He put his ear next to the, to the door of this booth, like this for two hours. I already know that when I finish the lecture, he's gonna run to me asking to convert. I already knew it, because I already saw by the way he's shocked like this with his ear. After all the Jews came and I finished with everyone, he was shy like this, came to me, doesn't speak so much English, but with a little that I understood, already asking how can he become Jewish. The only problem in Mexico, there's no convergence. No convergence in Mexico. What are you gonna do, bring him to America? What is he gonna do here? But just to show you, if a guy had two hours of proofs, immediately wants already to convert. And those Erev Rav, you speak 2,000 hours of proofs, and not only they don't become better, they actually become worse as you go. That's when you know they are Erev Rav. Neshamot shel Erev Rav. And the Gaon mi Vilna say, that they are the worst, they are much worse than the wicked of the Goim. The Gaon Mivilna say, they are much more evil than those Goim who wanted to destroy us and kill us, that we're going to suffer from them the most ever. That's the Galut of the Erev Rav. What's Erev Rav? Erev Rav is the souls of those Egyptians that Moshe Rabbeinu agreed to let them go out of Egypt with the Jewish nation. Every generation, they are being reincarnated. They come back in a new body, and another body, and another body. And every generation, they will always betray the Jewish name. Always. They betray us, and betray us, and betray us. One perfect example is George Soros. In the Holocaust, he helped the Nazis to find Jewish property that were hidden. That's why they didn't kill him. He was there, uh, snitched. And uh, I saw an interview that the guy asked him, there are many stories about you cooperating with the Nazis against your own people. Are you regretting it? I said, no. <laughs> no regret. Zero regret. Not even denying it. Normal person would try to say, oh, it's an evil rumor. What do you believe it? 
Confirmed. Choice. Didn't make any excuses. Yeah, you have to understand. I want. I didn't want to die. There was either that or they'll kill me. Okay, at least we understand where he came from. Proudly, no regret. Just when I asked the <coughs> Itzhak Rabin, was the ambassador of Israel in Washington, when he was before he became a prime minister. One person asked him, he wrote it in his book. When I was dumb in my old days, I used to waste time on the books of these people to read their biography, whatever. So in his own book, he, he writes, people ask me if I regret shooting on the Altalena boat that came from Europe with some Jews on it, and they brought weapon to the Jewish community who were fighting the Brits, the Arabs, you know. So people ask me, because in that attack, they started to shoot at the boat, 16 Jews died. Jews killed Jews. Why they killed Jews? Because Ben-Gurion gave an order to Yitzhak Rabin, which was the general on the field, meaning on the beach, no matter what, you don't let this boat enter Israel. Make them go away. But how can they go away? So we're talking about... Your father was there on the boat? So you know what I'm talking about. You have it from direct source. So they ask him, do you regret shooting and Jews and kill them? So he said, no. The old man, meaning Ben-Gurion, gave an order. And I was the general, and I followed the order. What was his end? He got a Jew killed him, and until today refused to regret. They asked him, you regret killing him? No, absolutely not. We will never see, let you see a daylight. I don't care. You will not be in contact with other prisoners. I don't care. You won't have anyone. I don't care. I regret I didn't kill Paris also. Wow. That's what he answered them. Third years later, he refused to regret. They told him, regret, you'll have a chance one day to go out. I won't regret. Same thing, measure for measure. Everything Hashem does is midah keneged midah. Where do we learn it? From Shabbat's parasha. That leads me now to what I really wanted to speak. It was a very long introduction. <laughs> now we're about to start the lecture. After uh, 90 minutes of introduction, we're starting now the lecture. Where do you find a lecture that the introduction is longer than the lecture? <laughs> Only yeah. here. So Rabotai, Rabotai, this song, Azinu, is the longest song in the Torah. It's longer than Az Yashir Moshe, it's longer than the Shira of Miriam, and uh, there are many things we learn from this parasha. I just want to highlight those things that applies to us today, that we should get the Musar of it. Azinu HaShamayim V'Adabera Heaven should hear when I speak, V'Tishma Aretz Imrei Pi and the earth should hear what comes out of my mouth. What is the difference in Hebrew, in Lashon HaKodesh, between the word Azinu or Shimu? Ma'azin or Shomea? What's the difference between Ma'azin and Shomea? If you ask an Israeli liberal from the university, a teacher, Hebrew teacher, tell him, hey, doctor, do you know what's the difference between Ma'azin and Shomea? We will tell you milim nirdafot. Similar words. There's no such thing in Lashon HaKodesh, similar words. There's no such thing. If you have similar words, that means they have at least one difference. At least one difference. Here, both of them are talking about hearing. Using your ear to hear what people speaking. But if the people are close to you, it's called lazin, because you can hear right away. If they are far, it's called lishmoa. 
Now Moshe is, is, is Neshama, is in Shamaim. He just came, this is the last day of his life already. That's it. Started already to go to the, Shem told him, go on our Nevo, show him all the generations that would live in Israel. He saw everything that happens there, include what happened now on Yom Kippur in Tel Aviv. Everything he saw. And now he said, go up to the mountain and die over there. Did you ever hear a story that Hashem comes to human being and says, go to this place because you have to die there? And immediately runs there? Why Moshe didn't argue? 515 times he prayed in Parashat Vaitchanan, please let me enter Israel, don't kill me, let me enter, let me enter. Hashem said, enough. Do not add another word in this topic. You're not entering Israel. Now Hashem said to him, go to the mountain and die. Moshe should have said, can you give me a few more days to live? Because right now it's mitzvah. Hashem commanded me to go up to the mountain that I should die there. How many people commit a mitzvah when they die? No one. Only one in history. That his death was a mitzvah. Meaning a command from Hashem. Go there to die. Meaning by going there, you're already fulfilling a command from Hashem. Like, like Hashem said, go and learn Torah. You're walking into the yeshiva, you're on the way to do mitzvah. It's unbelievable. So once Hashem said to Moshe, go to the mountain to die there, I just earned another mitzvah. From here we learn one more thing. Let's see who's clever here. What do you learn from this verse? Go up to the mountain that you should die there. What's, nah? the, what's the reason why he passed away the same, the same month as uh, he was born? Because the Gemara said that Sadiqim fulfilled their life, meaning they, they died the day he was born, the day he died, meaning he lived 120 years. My wife passed away the same, the same month as when she was born. Five mm. weeks ago. Unbelievable. Behmed is unbelievable. But, uh, but the question that I have now is, what do you learn from this that Hashem said to him, go to the mountain because you have to die over there? What do you learn from here? Two things you learn from here. One, nobody dies from natural causes. You die when Hashem says so. And where you're going to die, the Gemara say, the last day of your life, you don't have a free will anymore. You must go exactly to the location where you're supposed to die. You're supposed to die in a hospital, that's where you're gonna die. If it's in a car, it's in a car. If it's in your bedroom, it's in a bedroom. Meaning Hashem already decided how you're going to die, and where, and what time, and what second. Same thing when you're gonna get married. If it's the right shidduch, when exactly it's going to happen, it's written on Rosh Hashanah. That on that day, I don't know, the 20th of Tishrei, at 8.35 p.m. and 21 seconds, that's when your soul will merge together with the soul of your wife. Meaning two, one soul that was divided to two, is reunited to the second. Not the second before and not the second after. That's why sometimes the delays, unexpected delays. The rabbi is traffic, by the time he showed up, all of a sudden one of the witnesses can they find all kinds of things. You know, with Rav Moshe Feinstein it was a very interesting thing. He was Mesader Kiddushin. He was the rabbi in a wedding. The Khatan came to put the ring on the on the woman's finger and it fell. Then I picked it up. Areat mekudeshet li, hop, again it fell. You know, everyone looks for it. Then people started, you know how they enters. Oh, mishamayim, it's a sign that it's not a good shidduch. Right? <laughs> Already you hear whispering. Then, areat mekudeshet, third time he went in. Then someone came to him and said, Rabbi, you're not afraid that Hashem signaled to you that it shouldn't be... Oh, it wasn't that time, it wasn't that. He said, no. So why the ring fell twice? So because we needed two more minutes until the time was declared. Hashem was stalling it until the decree will be made. Meaning it cannot be a second before and a second after. 
whatever Hashem wrote on Rosh Hashanah, I know I have two Yemenite single guys that eat by me for years. They were in Monsi for, I don't know, more than 10 years. One is around 40 and one is around 30. So 10 years they are singles. About 10 years. They come for holidays, they come for Shabbatot. Rosh Hashanah came. Both of them got engaged after 10 years. Once Hashem decided, immediately. First engagement, a week later, second engagement. Why? No wonder Hashem put these two temanim together and they were best friends also. You know? Why? We don't know the calculation of Hashem. It connects to previous lives. There's a lot of reasons. One thing we do know, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is 100% righteous and fair. And we learn it from this parasha especially, which I'm going to read to you a few of the verses. So first, Rashi asks, why Moshe asked the, the heaven and earth to be witnesses to his speech? Heaven and earth should testify for what I say to the Jewish nation before my death. What does it mean, heaven and earth? Why? Because people, today they are here, tomorrow they die. For the next generation, who's going to testify? Heaven and earth are from day one to the last day of the creation. They will always be here. You may ask, heaven and earth can be here forever, but they are speechless. <laughs> they are mute. How can they testify? Heaven and earth can testify? Absolutely. The Gemara says when a person died, the walls of his house will come to testify in his trial about everything he did in his bedroom. Wow. Everything he did in hidden rooms. The walls will have a mouth and the mouth will begin to talk. Why? Because Hashem said so. You may say, but how can, how can a wall talk? I may ask, how can a person talk? What is a person? A person is what? Three dollars material, salt, minerals, iron, water, bones, flesh. Physically, it's a slice of pizza, your body. <laughs> your body worth less than a bagel with cream cheese. How all of a sudden it says such wonderful words? The answer, Hashem said so. Some people are mute. Hashem doesn't want them to talk. Just uh, yesterday in Yom Kippur, one person said, pray for this kid. He's already, how much? How? 11 years old and he doesn't speak. 11 years old. I heard about another kid, four years old, he doesn't speak. If Hashem decided, he don't speak. If Hashem decided the world will speak, the world will speak. If Hashem decided the donkey will speak, the donkey will speak. It's written in the Torah. Vayiftach Hashem et peh aton. Hashem opened the mouth of the donkey of Bilam. The donkey started to give Musa to Bilam, the prophet of the Goyim. Why you hit me three times? He got the shock of his life. His wife started to yell at him. Yeah, Bill Lama was living with his donkey, intimately, no what? joke. And, and by the way, it's a death penalty for the Goim. A death penalty from the Goim, it's intimacy with animals. To Jews, it's needless to say. Same thing, idol worshipping is death penalty for the Goim, also for the Jews. Chilul Shabbat is no death penalty for the Goim, actually the other way around. If they keep Shabbat, they risk their life. Because Shabbat is a gift to the Jewish nation only. But not to be an idol worshiper, Jews and Goim, it's both death penalty. Both. Relationship with animals, both of them death penalty. Some laws are more strict by the Goim than Jews. For instance, if a Goy steal, it's a death penalty for him. If a Jew steals, he has to pay double from what he stole, that's it. No death penalty. However, the sins that the, the, the seven laws of Noah have death penalty. Zero tolerance. 
You may ask, if that's the case, there should not be one Gentile left in the world. None of them ever stole. It's enough, you steal a quarter, that's it. You use a phone without permission, that's already stealing. You take a napkin from a pizza store without permission, it's stealing. You borrow a car from your friend, you tell them I'm going to pick up something from there, and on the way you stop in another place, that's also stealing. You just burn another dollar gas for him. You never ask permission for it. So not to be a thief, it's almost impossible. And if being a thief by the goyim is that penalty, not one of them should have survived, even the righteous one. So what do you see? The fact that there is a death penalty doesn't mean Hashem will enforce it instantly. Sometimes you live to 80, 90, and that's when you come to Hashem in the next world, that's when the punishment will come. Not all punishments are in this world. Most of the punishments are in the next world. Same thing, the reward is in the next world. So, Rabotai, let me read you some, my much jewels. It's like, it's like giving you jewelry here tonight. Uh, just give me a few more minutes. Ya'ofka matal likhi. My Musa that I'm giving you here now, the rebuke that I'm giving you, sometimes will fall on you like rain, and sometimes like dew, morning dew. What's the difference between rain and do? Rain, rain can be good and bad. Meaning, for some people it's great. If you're a farmer, and the rain falls in your field, you are dancing. Wow, it just saved me thousands of dollars of uh, sprinkle water. Baruch Hashem, the next two weeks I don't have to put you know, water in my field. Person walks in the street now with his new suit, the rain is a curse for him. Person that owns a car wash, the rain is a curse for him. Today now one car will come for car wash. Who comes to wash his car when it's raining? <laughs> Usually it doesn't happen. So for one person rain can be heaven, for the other person can be hell. Do it's good for everyone. No one suffers from it. Not only that, when you speak to someone, sometimes you have to speak like rain, thunders and rain. Sometimes you have to speak like do, softly, depend on a person. Some people can tolerate aggression. You have to be aggressive with them. They appreciate the honesty. Even if right now they don't understand most of what you tell them, but one thing they came out with the, in the conversation, they came up with one understanding. This one is like they say in Israel, dugri. You know what it means, dugri? Direct. Huh? Direct. Direct. Honest. Some people will tell you, Rabbi, I disagree with what you say, but I know you believe in what you say. You believe in it, you're not a faker. You say it, this is the way you live, this is what you believe in, I respect it. Once they realize you're faker, one day you say this, one day you say that, if it's rich, you're nice, if it's poor, you're aggressive, they know you're fake. So they know you always speak the truth regardless who is the listener. No politics involved. That's the truth. You like it, I'm happy, you don't like it, too bad. At least they, they, they're willing to accept your honesty. They may still criticize you. But they know at least you're not a faker. So Moshe said to them, some of my words will be like rain to you. Some of them will be like dew to you. Depend. To who? Tizal katali brati, like the dew is dripping. Softly, not like aggressive rain. Everyone is happy from the dew. Rain, rain is giving, making people sometimes upset, nervous. Or someone who just is busy with um, digging a hole to put wine in it. As soon as he put the wine, the rain begin. That's how they used to make ra wine in the old days. It's very bad for him. Rain surprised him. Right? So, some words are rain, some words are do. Chazal are telling us, you know, there is a verse, Kishem Hashem Ekra, Avu godel elokenu. What does it mean, Kishem Hashem Ekra? 
when I say the name of Hashem, I call in the name of Hashem, that's when I begin to praise Him. From here we learn the obligation, the Gemara says in Masechet Brachot, page 21, Minayin lebirkot ha-Torah lefanea. How do you know you have to say birkot ha-Torah before you begin your day? Before you begin to learn? In birkot ha-Shachar we say birkot ha-Torah. Sfaradim, they say birkot ha-Torah in the end of birkot ha-Shachar. The last two brachot and then birkat kohanim. The Ashkenazim say it in the beginning. But either way you have to say it before you start learning. So the question is, the Gemara asks, where did we learn that there is a special blessing before learning Torah. The answer, Kishem Hashem Ekra, Avu Godel Elokenu. Moshe comes to start singing to Hashem and praising Him. He said to the Jewish nation, I will bless Hashem first, and all of you answer Amen. Now, the Chachamim in the Gemara, they say like this, in the world of material, the world we live in, we have desires. If we're hungry, how, how, how great was the meal of last night? Huh? The best meal of the year, no? Even if it was so, not so delicious. When you're so hungry, it doesn't matter the food now. Even the filter fish you eat. I mean, when you're Sfaradi. Why? Listen, I didn't eat 25 hours. See, as soon as I see the filter fish, right away the alarm started. <laughs> so, why? You hungry now? There's no time to say delicious, not delicious, have salt, doesn't have, too sweet. Yalla, just give the food. We are starving. But when you're full, it's very hard to bless Hashem. I'll give you an example. The Chachamim say, when a person is hungry, now he's eating, eating, eating until he's stuffed, right? When he's hungry, he has no problem making bracha on the food because he's so excited and he's about to fress now. The last of his problem is saying bracha. Yalla, let me say the bracha that I can eat already. After he's full, he's falling asleep already in the table, the Yetzer Ara kills him. Oh no, three minutes benching now. Oh, poor guy. So hard. Oh my God, my machronim now to get up. Why the Chachamim made such a long bracha? Three hours eat. I don't want to say like what? Two and a half minutes to say thank you to Hashem, which most of it is personal requests. After Bonnet Yerushalayim, everything from there on, give us, give us, give us, it's a list. It's an email to Hashem. I need this and this and this and shalom and peace and children. And it's all, uh, you know, Chachamim attached it to Birkat Amazon because it's the Oraita. So most of the request is selfish request, but he complains about it. Imagine like you come to a rich man, you don't have what to feed your children in a holiday, so you have a list of what you need. I need meat, I need fish, I need bread, I need this, I need clothes, I need five suits. You have a $5,000 request over there. And you come, you stand in front of the rich, uh, rich person, and uh, you get aggravated now that it takes you a minute to make your request. The rich person say, well, I'm doing you a favor and you are angry that you had to request from me what you need? It, it doesn't make sense. So, Rabotai, once a person is full, immediately he wants to kick. I'm okay. I managed. I don't need you anymore. That's in the subconscious. Well, Divrei Torah is the other way around. To start, you're not hungry. The Satan makes you fool always. Fooling you. I'm good, I'm good. I learn enough. Like my son said to me, we learn in school 10 hours. I said, no, but what now? Now it's time to rest. <laughs> Why? <laughs> the Satan. But once I convince him to see it, he can sit 20 hours straight to learn. The more he learn, the more he gets into it the more hungry you become. 
Don't you ask yourself how can someone like Rav Ovad Yosef or Rav Eliashiv or all these giant Chachamim could not live a day without Torah, a second without Torah, to the point that Rav Ben Zion Abba Shaul say, when my cousin asked him, what's the hardest mitzvah for you to keep? And he said to him, I don't understand how it's possible to sit a few minutes in the bathroom without thinking about Torah. Yeah, thank God for your wife. It's the hardest thing for me, the hardest, to be the five, ten minutes that I sit a day in the bathroom and make my mind not think about Torah, because in the bathroom you're not allowed to think about Torah. I don't know how people can do it. He already was in a level that you knew that there was now one minute in his life, besides those minutes in the bathroom, if he succeeded, that there was not one minute in his life that he's awake and he's not thinking about Torah. Who can raise his hand here and say that it's the same by him? Huh? Do you have... to your lectures, that's, that's true for me. Yeah, but, but the, the question is, every minute, every minute of your life, nothing matters besides Torah. People wants to talk to you about the weather, nah, nah. Wants to talk to you about politics, I want to hear. Wants to talk to you about Parnassah, there's a great deal. Don't talk, don't waste my time. To the point that my cousin asked his student, how did you, how did you learn to make such a bow tie? He said to him, well, someone taught me, and I learned. I said, no, that's not what I'm asking. I ask, how did you agree to waste 10 minutes on something like this from your life? In this level, I just cannot understand that a Bachur Yeshiva that sits and learns Torah would go and waste 10 minutes on something like this. But how many people in the world are in this level that the Torah is their entire life? You understand? You know, when the Shas, the religious party, 20 something years ago, by surprise, they got 17 seats in the Knesset. From four, they jumped to 17. Why? Because they wanted to prosecute their leader, to put him in jail. They put him in jail in the end. <coughs> but he made a videotape. Ani Ma'ashim. I blame. Who is, who is he blaming? The lefties, all this Erev Rav. But he, the blaming was mainly against the, it was a race, it was a, his claim was racist. Meaning they hate me because I'm Moroccan, because I'm Sfaradi, because I'm religious. So those kind of uh, communist Ashkenazim, they hate us. So a lot of Sfaradi non-religious people on purpose voted for the religious party, thanks to that video. They got the shock of their life. All of a sudden they got 17 seats and they only have seven or eight members. <laughs> they need to find now another nine immediately to post them in the government. So they came to Rav Elbaz. Rav Ruven Elbaz is the pioneer that started the Tshuva movement in Israel. It's the first one who got this idea to go and talk to people and turn them into religious. 50 years ago, something like that. So Rav Ruven Elbaz, which is a very big tzaddik, he has 200 institutions. 200 is kindergarten, seminary, banot, synagogues. But the main yeshiva that he has is Or Chaim in Yerushalayim. Many, many floors. Yeshiva for Baalei Tshuva. Now a lot of bright Baalei Tshuva, they sit in that yeshiva and learn. People that, you know, knows the secular world. So they came to Rav Elbaz, and those days my cousin was one of the rabbis there in his yeshiva. Don't get you 25 years ago, something like this, 22 years ago. Rabbi, who you recommend? We need big people with sharp brain that will be in the Knesset to make an impact. He says he is the sharpest. So they came to him. We have wonderful news for you. <laughs> now remember, in those days, he was learning three days straight Gemara, sleeping on a wood bench. In my own eyes, I once came to visit him. I saw him sleeping on a wood bench. So why is he sleeping like this? Because he doesn't go home at night. He sits and learns until he falls asleep, a little bit, an hour on a bench. 
and right away begin another 10, 20 hours, sleep like this on a bench. So they come to him and say, Mazal Tov Rabbi, you were recommended by the Rosh Yeshiva to be a minister in the government. You're going to go to the Knesset. Now everyone, almost everyone, was dying to get such a job. It's a salary for life. They give you a brand new Volvo. Volvo in Israel is like a Mercedes here. You have a driver, and you have all kinds of benefits. You don't pay electric, you have this. If you ever need a legal advice, you get it for free. That prime minister that sued me, he doesn't pay for the lawyers. He took the most expensive lawyer. The government paid for that. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so, he said to them, that's the biggest insult that someone insulted me in my life. I got the shock of their life. <laughs> Ma? <laughs> We're offering you to be a minister in the Knesset? And you say that that's an insult? I say, yes. To sit with all these wicked people over there and to hear the garbage that comes out of their mouth sitting next to them in one place, Moshav Letzim, leaving the holy Torah and look at their lousy face one time. How can you even imagine such thing? But they are politicians. Politicians already got sucked into that fake world. To be a politician, you must be crooked. That's the system, that's the laws of this world. If you are an honest politician, you won't survive an hour. An hour you won't survive. Your own members from your party will vomit you out. Just like being a lawyer. Can you be an honest criminal lawyer today without being a big liar and deceiver and a crook? Impossible. Show me one successful criminal lawyer who never say lies. If you have a lawyer who never say a lie, lawyer it sounds like liar. It's not a surprise. So if you find one criminal lawyer that can, can connect them to a lie detector and say, did you ever say a lie in your life? And he will say no, I think the machine will go on fire. The lie detector. But the question is, if a lawyer will accept on himself never to say a lie, ever, how quick he will be out of the job? Maximum a week. He will get fired by all his people. Imagine uh, this guy, the murderer, the rapist. Hey, what's up? He's sitting over there. Hey, listen, I decided to tell the judge all the truth of the, the incident. Ma, <laughs> what? You're fired immediately. What do you mean? I hire you to teach me how to lie. Impossible. The whole system is based on lies. You know how the police catch three criminals that robbed the place. They say to them, the first one who talked against his friends, get a deal. So it could be that the one who invented the idea to rob that store and the one that actually did all the bad thing, and the other two were two idiots who just followed him, he turned against them, they go to 20 years in prison, and he's out after two years, or one year, or six months. Why? A justice system with zero justice in it. Zero justice in America, in Israel. Just the fact that you have jurors, ordinary people, that some of them are extremely stupid and prejudiced and racist and don't have, have zero God feeling into, into them. Zero. They can care less to release a murderer. Why you released him? I'm black, he's black. I want him on the street. But what about, he doesn't bother you that he kills people? No, he kills white people, what do I care? Could be the other way around. I'm white, he's white, he killed black people. Very good. Let him go back in the street. It doesn't bother you, kill black people? No. Why? Racist, Nazi. Do you get the point or no? I, I let him out. Why? He's Hasidish. But, but he robbed the bank. I'm a Hasid, he's a Hasid. He's my cousin, he's a friend of my cousin. What does it have to do with justice? 
leave the justice to Hashem. The idea of putting jurors, Roger Simpson is the best example. Remember Roger Simpson? All you need is one or two black people in the jurors and they refuse to convict him. Even though there's so much evidence, they understand him free. So the idea is that this whole system of jury, it's terrible. Because some of them don't even understand what it means to be a judge. They don't understand the consequences of sending an innocent person to jail or letting a criminal back on the street. But what are you complaining to the jurors? Complain to the lawyers. For three or two hundred thousand dollars, he's willing to put a serial killer back on the street knowing it will cause the death of at least five or ten or twenty more people. You can care less. So in reality, if you come to that lawyer and say, take a gun, shoot twenty people in the head and we'll give you two hundred thousand dollars for it, will he do it? Technically, what's the difference? What's the difference? So, Rabotai, we continue. So, Atsur Tamim Paolo, this is what I... Shh, this is what I wanted to speak about, mainly, and I got to it finally. I was afraid the time would run out. Atsur Tamim Paolo, Kichol Derachav Mishpat. Atsur means Hashem. The source, Tzur means source, source of everything, it's Hashem. Tamim Paolo. Rock. Tzur, you know, is solid like a rock. Tamim Paolo, meaning his actions are complete and perfect. There's no, he doesn't do half a job. 90% of the job, there's no defect in his actions. Kichol derachav mishpat. Every interaction of Hashem in a creation is based on justice. Judgment and justice. You know how the Americans love to say, don't be so judgmental. You know that or no? In America, it's a, in America there are few key, key few key, key, key words, key sentences. Few key sentences that Americans like to use very frequent. One, you're so abusive. <laughs> Elias Smiley, you heard it probably many times. Stop. Second, you're so judgmental. Right? That's a very common thing. So, let me make some declarations here. Republicans say neither of those things. Let me make a declaration. One is, it's not a sin to be judgmental, it's an obligation. Every person in the world must be judgmental. If not, he's a total fool. You must be judgmental. If you know someone is is ways to rob people or to borrow and not to pay back. When he comes to talk to you about money, you have to judge him that he's about to come to scam you. Immediately, you have to go into caution. Oh, he's so judgmental. He only wanted to make a conversation. No, 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 he's a crook. He already had a list of victims. I'm his next victim. Why are you so rude to him? Why you kicked him out? Why? It's mitzvah to kick him out. No mitzvah to let a crook into my living room that a minute later he will rob me. If you go to a bad neighborhood, bad neighborhood, statistics show that a lot of people got mugged there, a lot of people got shot there, even police are afraid to go there. If you go there and you take your gun with you, why are you so judgmental? When you go to Monsi, you don't take your gun with you or to Lakewood. One, when you went to that neighborhood, you took a knife and a gun and a pepper spray. You're so judgmental, you're racist. Enough with your nonsense. There's nothing to do with racism. This neighborhood, black, white, Chinese, Arab, who cares? Dangerous or not? Nothing to do with race. Dangerous? I'm going there with a gun. Oh, I'm not going there at all. Refuse to go there. Why? I care about my life. Other neighborhood is nice and clean and free, regardless what color they are or what nationality. Why not? I'll go there. Nothing to do with, with races. Judgmental, it's an obligation. 
You have to be judgmental. You go on a date with a girl and she tells you she vote Democrats. Immediately you have to get up and leave. <laughs> Why? She's pro-murdering babies. She's pro-gay marriage. She's pro-idiots. You cannot marry such a girl. You must be judgmental. Maybe in the end we will find out that she was one of the only normal Democrats in America. Maybe. <laughs> I'm not a prophet. If she tells me she votes for Sleepy Joe, I don't want her as my wife. Why? It's against the Torah. It's against the Torah. Nothing to do with personal opinion here. So there are many things to be judgmental. If they invite you to speak in Tel Aviv University, you must refuse. Why? Because you know they won't let you say a word there. They will stand and bark like evil dogs at you. You won't be able to say one sentence. If they invite you to a lefty studio to speak on a live show, you know they won't let you say a sentence. Why should you go? If they invite you in Channel 14, you should go. You know they'll give you a fair chance to speak. You must be judgmental in every step of your life. You must be judgmental with who you go into the car with. Maybe he's a crazy driver. I don't want to get killed. You must be judgmental when a drug addict on the street approach you for tzedakah. You must assume that he's going to use it for heroin. That's why you're not going to give him a, a penny. When you donate to an organization, you have to be judgmental. You have to see how they spend the money, how much goes on their luxury business class and fancy cars and fancy restaurants. And there are many organizations like this that not even 1% of what you donate to them go to the cause. Like the like all these bombastic American organizations, constantly collect millions. I saw an article, not even 10% of what they collect goes to the actual cause they declare on a commercial. So you have to be judgmental. You have to be judgmental in which yeshiva to send your kids to, in which school, in which school not to send them to. Why? It's the life of your children. If that yeshiva already have bad reputation that a lot of kids were going off the derech over there, why would you like to send your children and jeopardize them? You're so judgmental. It's not fair. You're judging the rabbis over there. That's your obligations, you fool. It's the life of your children. Every person is judgmental. That the only thing is most of them are hypocrites. When it's not convenient for them, they use it. It's so judgmental. And you are not? When you see a religious person, you're not judgmental? Of course you are. I'm allowed, you are not allowed. Democracy, only lefties are allowed. That's democracy, today. So, here you go. So, Rabotai, what does it mean? Hashem is perfectly honest, perfectly perfect. <coughs> what does it mean? Moshe, inst Moshe instructs the Jewish nation that everything that happens to them, they should accept with love. You lost your money, thank you, Hashem. You lost a child, thank you, Hashem. It's very hard. Thank you, Hashem. You sleep on the street, thank you, Hashem. You now just found out you're sick, thank you, Hashem. Your shidduch did not go through, thank you, Hashem. You lost your home, thank you, Hashem. It's very hard. It's easy to say thank you, I just made a million dollars in a deal. I just had a baby boy, it's easy, everyone say thank you. Even the Hamas terrorist that is soon gonna raise this boy to be a murderer and to go and explode himself to kill Jews, also say thank you when little Ahmad was born. He already has in his mind to train him to be a terrorist when he's 12, to put bombs on him, and he should go in a bus stop and blow some Jews up. That's what he did with his other children. But when, he's, when he was born, wow, you should see what a party he makes. He gives baklawas, he slather a goat, everybody dancing, Allah Akbar. Why, why are you happy? In a few years you're going to send him to die, what? Why? Right now I'm happy that he was born. When he dies, I'll be even more happy. Why? Because they believe he goes to heaven because he murdered some Jews. Jihadist. What do you expect from them? So, Abotai, listen to this. The Gemara says, This is Gemara in Masechet Brachot, page 9. 
Everything Hashem is giving you with the measurement that He decides. A lot, little bit, nothing, too much. There's no, there's no mistakes. Thank Him greatly. It's written there in the Gemara, page 60. Brachot, in the name of Rabbi Akiva. Le'olam, always. Yeah, Adam Ragil Omar, a person should be used to say, call the Aved Rachmana Latav Aved. Everything Hashem does, He does for the good. What do you mean for the good? There was a horrible accident. Children just died. Can you say it's good? Yes. You don't see the good. You don't see who these children are. Maybe they just went express now to heaven. What are you complaining about? What kind of life they would have here in Brooklyn? Become an American spoiled kids and drug addicts, age 15? Or running after the fun, like they say in America, I want to have fun. Fun usually makes you wicked. Now this child died in Talmud Torah. Remember the Sassoon family? Yeah. All the holy children from Talmud Torah got burned. Express to heaven. What is, what is the question, Bechlal? So now, of course, a horrible tragedy. We cried for months. The family, everyone, not just the family. Until today, when you, when you think about it, you, you want to faint. But in reality, let's describe for a second a scenario that Hashem would show us now a five minutes movie and show each one of them next to Rashi, Rambam, Rabbi Akiva, glowing, enjoying every second. And we would have the chance to ask them, would you want to come back to Brooklyn? They look, they look at you out of your mind to come back to Brooklyn? Yeah, but your mother is misses you, you know, missing you. I mean, your uncles, your this, your friends, your, your rabbis in yeshiva. Won't you want to come back and be with your friends and family? I mean, yeah, yeah, it hurts that some people are missing us. But no matter what you give us, we don't want to come to this world for another second. Forget about an hour. A second. How do we know it? From Shmuel. Prophet Samuel. He was already in heaven. The Torah says equal like Moshe and Aaron combined. King Saul had a war and he was very worried. He went and called the soul of Shmuel, like seance. And the soul of Shmuel came back to the world and the Gemara say he got very, very nervous and upset. He thought that Hashem took him out of heaven and rejudged him. Why all of a sudden he's back in this world? And then it's when he yelled at Shaul, Lama irgastani la'aloteni? How did you dare to get me so upset to bring me back to this world? Bring back the soul from heaven. How long he was in this world? The whole conversation was five, ten minutes most. That's it. And he went back to his place in heaven. But the suffering of being back in this world five, ten minutes already was beyond words. Rogues, meaning... You're very nervous. Someone who is in heaven wants to come back to this world. This world is a test. Someone that went to be a doctor and is going through massive four-hour test. Finally, now 10 years later, then he's a big surgeon, I don't know, cardiologist, making millions of dollars, having a fancy office, thousands of clientele. They say to him, would you like to go back to medical school to that four hours test? Oh, you're crazy, it's a nightmare just to think about these four hours. You know, you know how much I suffer in those four hours? Thinking, will I pass, will I fail? Who wants to come back to the test? So this world is a test. Listen, Rabotai, listen to what Chazal said. really important question. No, no, no question, oh, please. No what? question. No. Okay. Atzur tamim paolo. Hashem, his actions are complete. Kichol drachav mishpat. Everything Hashem does is by judgment. Rav Aaron Levin, he said, as, we know there's a famous question that everybody asks. Tzadik vera lo, rasha vetov lo. It's not my question. Righteous people suffer. 
sometimes wicked people enjoy, celebrate for the time being, it looks that there's lack of justice, right? The answer to this question, Rabotai, is we are unable to judge or to understand, first of all, who is righteous and who is wicked, because we don't always see what they do in hidden rooms. But even if we knew for sure this is righteous and this is wicked, we do not know that what happens to them right now is good and bad. What looks good can end very bad. What looks bad can end very good. Two examples I'll give you. Yosef, when the brother threw him to the pit, it was a massive tragedy, right? It looked like the end of the world for him. He lost his father, his chevruta, his brothers stuck him with a knife in his back. He will never ever see his family. He's going to now be a servant for the rest of his life in San Francisco over there. Who knows what they're going to do to him? Such fears, such, and then they put him 12 years in prison. It couldn't be worse than that. From age 17 to age 30, his life was living hell. Think about it. From the minute he ended up in the pit until he was released age 30 and became the minister of finance of the whole world, he went through 13 years of a nightmare. Every day was a much nightmare. You know what it means to be in prison in Egypt in those days, in a pit? No electric, no nothing. Today at least they have TV, they can watch lectures. They can do things, the prisoners. You know, some watch lectures, some watch basketball. Well, they have something to do. They have a gym, this, that. What do you have in Egypt? No electric, no electronic, no nothing. You have to be with all goim around you, who wants to slaughter you alive. Think about the, the life he had 12 years in prison. Being innocent. You don't belong there, Bichlal. It's all a fake story she made. So it looked like the biggest nightmare. And that was a preparation for turning you into a king. 80 years, all the money in the world will be under your signature. Whatever you decide, you control all the money in the world. And you save your entire family from starvation. And you save the whole Jewish, Jewish nation from death. This whole 13 years process came with a huge reward. Not only you saved your entire family, you brought them to Egypt, they would die from starvation. You gave them a place, and there was a preparation for Matan Torah, and plus you're the only one that it's written about him that is a tzaddik in the Torah, Yosef a tzaddik. I have the most important question. No questions, please. Okay, fine. So, Yosef a tzaddik, how many people the Torah call them tzaddik? What do we see, Rabotai? What looks right now as a nightmare? It's maybe planting seeds for wonderful ending. Or the other way around. Sometimes it looks like the greatest thing. Rav Zilberstein brings in his book a very sad example. He said one time he was on the bus on the way to Yerushalayim. And the bus was stuck over an hour in traffic. He was wondering what can happen. You know, as the bus is slowly moving, he saw a brand new fancy BMW smashed. Some truck fell on it. There were five family members. They all died on the spot. Rav Zilberstein writes in his book, when the owner of the, of the car, the, the head of the family, when he bought that BMW for $200,000 in Israel, everything is more than double the near. Very expensive BMW, fancy, big. How many people were jealous? Wow, such a lucky guy. Look what the car he drives. We take buses, we sweat. Back then there was no air condition in the buses. I remember taking buses to school, no AC. No, you see, the humidity of, the, of Tel Aviv, you know what it is? That, that's what it is. And now you see someone next to you with a fancy BMW, air condition, nice music. So you're thinking, how lucky this guy and how miserable I am, right? Thousands of people every day would think that. Anyone would like to replace with him? You take the bus, give me the BMW. Now when they see how it ended, so buying the BMW was a good thing. It made him very happy. I'm sure he came to the parking three times a day to check if someone scratched the car or not. 
He couldn't say Shema at night from excitement. In the middle of Shema, he went down to see the car again, smell the leather. Ah, it's so great. Would he ever dream that his entire family would be buried under this piece of metal? So the reality here is that we don't know what's good and what's bad. There's no way to know. They accepted your son to yeshiva. It looks great. You're very happy. You prayed for it. Maybe that would be the end of him in this yeshiva. I know kids went to specific yeshiva, and that's when they became drug addicts from some abuser idiot that abused them, and they went to drugs. When you fought and used connection for rabbis to call and ask them to take him, did you ever dream that will be the end of your child? No. Never dream such thing. In reality, Rabotai, things that look horrible sometimes are actually good. And things that look excellent sometimes actually are very bad. So we don't really know what's good and bad. Therefore, there is no way for us to judge what's right, what's wrong. <laughs> Only Hashem knows what's good and bad. But I don't even need to go to such a deep philosophy. I don't understand the question. It's written in the end of Parashat Vaitchanan that Hashem paid the wicked for the good that they do in this world and reserve the reward for the righteous for the afterworld. It's a clear verse. So what's the question? I'll tell you what's the question. Everybody that reads the Torah knows that righteous get the reward in this world because they don't have a share to, uh, the wicked gets the reward in this world because they don't have a share to the eternal next world. And the righteous, they have to wait for the reward. As it's written clearly that Hashem delayed the reward. The question is, why wicked people sometimes also suffer? That's the question. And why righteous people sometimes have the life? They have Olam Abba, they have the next world, and they have this world. Some billionaires. There are billionaires in their religious community. They live in beautiful homes. They have private jets. They give millions of dollars to Tzlaka. Everyone beg them everywhere they go. Can I take a picture with you? He's on top of the world. Everyone beg to, to, to marry his children. 300 offers for every child. Why? I won't have to ever worry about money. My son, my son will have everything with his daughter. Or my daughter will have everything with his son. This is the way the world is. So wait a minute. They have this world and the next world. So why? What's going on here? My two worlds to have? That's a dilemma. That's a big question. If all righteous people will suffer in this world and enjoy the eternal world and all wicked people enjoy in this world and don't have a share to the world to come, okay, no questions asked. The question is rising when we know the formula, when we see wicked people have a lot, we know it's not, nothing to be jealous with them. The question is why the other wicked person has nothing. There are wicked people who sleep on the street. They were so wicked and Hashem put them to be homeless. Ungrateful monsters. Everyone helped them in life. They stepped them in the back until Hashem decided to throw them to live in the streets. And now everyone has mercy on them. They see them freezing in a park. They don't know the 30 years what they did before until Hashem threw them to the street. The question is why Hashem threw them to the street and the other wicked person lives in a hundred million dollar mansion. That's when the Pasuk says, listen carefully, Atzur Tamim Paolo, don't ask questions about God. He knows exactly what's good, he knows what's bad. He knows the entire process, reincarnation, previous life, the life before, the life before, where is he going? What, where is coming from? His difficulties. What's, what was the, the difficulty of the test? Because for one person it's very easy not to steal, and the other person is extremely difficult not to steal. For one it's a very hard test, for the other one there's no test. There's no test, naturally it's not a thief. One person is very, very nice and faithful, watch his eyes, don't look at the women. The other one, that's all he thinks about. One doesn't have any 
anxiety or desire to run and commit sins. And the other one, all he thinks about is only this. For him, one out of ten times he fell. But nine times he fight his Yetzirah not to go and commit the sin. But if someone doesn't know what's go through his mind, once in a while he see him commit a sin. It was with that girl, with that girl. Over the years he already committed 20, 30 sins. But he overcame 500 tests. He fell 20 times, but 500 times he actually made it. The other person who right now is looking at him and thinking, what a wicked guy. I already saw him committing sins with 20 different girls in the last 20 years. Such a faker. How is he walking with a yarmulke and tzitzit, this guy? That guy who thinking like that doesn't have any desire. He's, he's, he's married. has no yetzerara for women. He has yetzerara for lashonara all day. Non-stop. Non-stop. That guy doesn't have any desire to speak lashonara. You meet over the years people that are very good with one specific mitzvah. Like I have a friend. No matter what you do, you're not going to get a bad word out of his mouth. He cannot speak against anyone. Nothing. Why? Solid like a rock when it comes to Lashonara. Then you have people, they finish Shachris at 10.30 or 11 or 12. And what do they do the rest? Until Mincha, they sit by the coffee machine in a shtibol and speak Lashonara all day. They have to know everything. The Yetzirah, they can't stop. They can't stop. So one person has a test, the other person is a joke. That's why Chazal said, don't come to con jump to conclusion when you see someone is doing something wrong, because if you would be in his feet, in his shoes, maybe you would actually do a worse thing than him. Right now you're not in his feet, meaning you don't have that desire. But if you would be where he is, ho, oh, oh, ho, oh. ho, that's what the Gemara brings us a perfect example of Rav Ashi that was teaching in yeshiva and say tomorrow we're going to learn about our friend Menashe. Menashe was the son of Chizkiyahu the king, Chizkiyah. He lived a thousand years before Rav Ashi. Rav Ashi wrote the Talmud. You know what a legend he is? What a holy person he was to write such a book together with Ravina, Ravashi, and Ravina. To write the whole Talmud, 400 years of halacha, history, events, everything with no contradiction, thousands of different subjects, everyone's opinion, edit that together. Even with computers, no one would be able to do such thing today. See, right away, it's divine. It's impossible to do it. But the question is, Rabotai, Rav Ashi said, tomorrow we're going to learn about our friend Menashe. At night, Menashe came to him in a dream. How do you dare to call me your friend? Who do you think you are? Rav Ashi, the holy tzaddik, Talmud Chacham, that wrote the Talmud, now is being attacked by Menashe. The biggest Mahti Arabim. Sixty years, his statues were all over Israel. Everyone, come, come, bow down to my idols. His father, the biggest tzaddik, the biggest king. He is the worst one. He did Shuvah in the end of his life. Most of his life was extremely wicked. So Menashe comes to Ravashi. You dare to call me your friend? Who do you think you are? He said, who, who am I? With all due respect, we read about you in the Tanakh. He said to him, if you're such an important rabbi, Ravashi, can you tell me when you have a bread, when you want to eat the bread, what part of the bread you cut first? Ravashi said, I didn't know there is any specific laws about it. So you have to cut from the most well done place. The place that is the most well done, that's where you have to cut from. So Ravashi told him, if you're such a chacham, that you know every halacha, 
How is it possible that you were the biggest Mahdi Arabim? You made so many people become idol worshippers as results of your wickedness. So he said to him, if you lived in my generation, you would lift your coat and run sprint to serve those idols. If you knew the, how strong was the Yetzer Hara to be an idol worshipper. Meaning, a person has a child that is dying. Another hour he'll be dead. You go to some idol, some goy there, Abra, Kadabra, this, ma, me, Ichigdana, you know. And you come to him, say, put 50 bucks in a jar, sit over here, put this on your head, say, repeat after me, put the boy here, shh, all kinds of things, you're good, take him home, he's healthy. You come out, the boy gets up, begin to run. It's against the Torah. He went to an idol worshiper, some black magic, it's against the Torah. Against the Torah or not, I cannot see my son dying. So let me go to hell for that. It's a very big test. How many Jews in the Holocaust put their children by nuns and priests? In France, in Germany, by orphanage home, by idol worshiper Christians. Meaning they know that these babies will turn into Christian idol worshippers who bow down to JC and their nonsense. But their heart did not let them let these children die. They rather the children not die and become idol worshippers for the rest of their life than that they die now and go to heaven. Because if the children will die now by the Nazis, for sure they go to heaven, guaranteed. They didn't even get to Bar Mitzvah. Everyone who dies before Bar Mitzvah has finished his tikkun. So they would rather that their children die, live, become idol worshippers all their life, live in a lie all their life, not even knowing they're Jewish, as long as they won't kill them, the Nazis. So they hid them by the Christians, the orphanage home. There's the famous story of Rav Toledano, the Moroccan holy rabbi, who went with one Ashkenazi rabbi to France after the war. He speaks French, the Moroccans, they speak French. The Ashkenazi rabbi speaks Yiddish. He couldn't talk to the French people over there. So he took with him the rabbi. They knocked on the gate of the big orphanage home in, in France. Thousands of kids there. Right after the war. <laughs> one nun opened the, opened the door. Can I help you? She see two rabbis. Huh? Yeah, so one, uh, one nun opened the door, we want to speak to the head priest over here. They let him in. One priest came, he said, we came to, to collect all the Jewish kids that were left by you in the war. He said to him, they grew up, it's been a few years. I myself don't even know who is Jewish and who is not here. Everyone left the kids and that's it. Well, how, am I, how am I supposed to know? I would love to help you, but uh, there's no way for me to tell you. He said, we will tell you who is Jewish, don't worry. You just give us access to them one minute. He got curious, the priest. They went in, the Ashkenazi rabbi started to scream, Shema Israel in Yiddish accent, the way these children are used to. And some of these kids started to scream, Mommy, Mommy. Why? Because a Jewish mother, before she put her children to sleep, what did she read to them? Shema Israel, in Yiddish accent. Now they are with this goyim in a church. Let's say they put them over there when they were three, four. Now they're seven, eight, nine, whatever they are. It's been already a few years they didn't hear Shema Israel. As soon as they heard that, immediately they scream, Mommy, Mommy. They ran to the rabbi, all of them. He said, you see? He said, take them quick before anyone finds out. I brought them to Israel, these children. I would love to know what's, what happened with those children after they saved them, brought them to Israel. I don't know the rest of the story, but it would be very interesting to find out the rest of it. But here you go. These children 
had some merit to get saved. But their parents did a very, very stupid things by leaving them over there. They should have let the Nazis do what they do. If Hashem decided the children die, they died. If not, they live. It's up to Hashem who lives and die. But at least you know one thing, when a child dies, especially when they kill him because he's Jewish, and he did not commit any sins yet, he goes express to heaven. The problem is that we go with the heart, not with the head. That's our main problem in life. When someone says to you something from the Torah, you are used to different kind of knowledge that you learn in public school, or by all kinds of heretics, or by the media you're watching 24-7. When a rabbi comes and says to you, Michalel Shabbat has a bigger punishment than a murderer, immediately you tar- you. You label him as a crazy wacko. How does, you, how does he compare even a Mechalel Shabbat to a murderer? It's not normal. Why? Because you were brainwashed that it's fine to be Mechalel Shabbat. It's no big deal. And you were brainwashed that it's horrible to be a murderer, which is true. So half of the information they raised you with was correct. It's terrible to be a murderer. That part, they did a good job. The other part, to teach you that Mechalel Shabbat is much worse than a murderer, they did a horrible job. They hid that from you. Maybe they didn't even know it. As results of that, you accept every Mechalel Shabbat like a hero in your house, and you don't want any connection with murderers. Why? They are filthy. Who wants to be friends with them? Ah, but Mechalel Shabbat, that makes Hashem much more angry. Don't be crazy, Rabbi, you're too extreme. You're too extreme. Let's read about what the Torah says about too extreme. Listen, Rabotai, listen to this. It says, Rabbi Yaakov ben Asher, Baal Aturim, the son of Rabbeinu Asher, opened his chibur on Choshen Mishpat in Arba Aturim, brings the Mishnah of Rabban Shimon ben Gamliel in Masechet Avot, chapter 1, Mishnah 18. Al shlosha dvarim ha'olam omed. There are three pillars that are holding the world. One is judgment. Judgment. Two is the truth. And three is peace. Din, emet, veshalom. Where do we learn it? From this verse. Atzur Tamim Paolo, Hashem made the world in a perfect way and he made three foundations to the world, three pillars. One is the judgment. Kichol derachav mishpat. He can't move an inch without judgment. Okay, next. The emet. El emuna ve'en avel. Everything by Hashem is based on 100% true. Not 99.9, 100%. And three, peace, tzaddik, ve'yasharu. The first two, it's obvious. The third doesn't make so much sense. It said that Hashem is righteous and honest. How does it contribute to the peace? The answer is, because we know Hashem is a fair judge and everyone in the end will get what he deserves, it prevents fighting. Why don't you sue him? Why don't you send someone to kill him? Why don't you publish him in the, in the internet? Hashem knows exactly what he deserved. The judge will give him exactly what he deserved when he thinks it's the right time. Maybe it's not the right time now. Maybe I'll do something worse. Maybe I'll help him if I punish him now. Leave him to Hashem. Ah, oh, it's already 10 years and he only, look, he stole the money from you and he opened a store and another store and he bought a house and you don't have what to feed your children. Where is the justice? No questions are asked against Hashem. He knows exactly what I deserve from this life, from past life. Maybe that's my punishment. Who knows what I've done? He did what he did. He gets what he deserves. Everyone will get exactly what they deserve for good and for bad. Therefore, when you have such a munah, tzaddik v'yasharu, Hashem does not deprive anyone, Hashem does not forget anyone, what is the urge to fight? 
They don't want to pay me, fine. It's between you and Hashem, what can I say? The idea is Rabotai, the world would be a wonderful place if everyone would live to Hashem everything. If people would know that Hashem gives everyone what they deserve, most criminals will not act on their crimes. They won't do anything. If you know for sure, you'll get punished. What's the point of stealing? What's the point of speaking Lashon Hara? What's the point of hurting a person when you know it's coming to you big time? Today there's lack of faith. Ah, Hashem not always punish. Here, this wicked guy, this one, this one, politicians, look what they do, nobody does anything. The Satan is a genius. He, con he convinces every one of us that Hashem is partially asleep. Sometimes he reacts. Most of the time, the, the criminals get away with that. That's the biggest scam. The biggest. Because no one gets away with anything. No one. And that's what people have to understand. And this is all in a speech of Moshe Rabbeinu here. It's all in Parashat Azinu. Then the next thing Moshe says, Who is Avicha? Not your biological father. Maybe your father is Mechalel Shabbat. Maybe your father is heretic. Maybe your father is Santa Claus. You should be heretic like him. Chas v'shalom. He's heretic. You be tzaddik. Ah, but he's my father. Doesn't mean you have to follow his evil way. Who is Avicha? Shloshet Avot, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Zkene Auma. All three of them are called Zkenim. Avraham, Zaken, Baba Yamim. Zaken. Zaken is a very good title. Ze Kana Chochma, the Gemara say. The high scholar. Yitzchak, Vayi Ki Yitzchak, Zaken, Vayi Ki Zaken Yitzchak. Yaakov, Vene Yaakov, Kavdu Mi Zoken. His eyes became, already oh, he doesn't see good. Why? He became old. Zaken. Moshe said, go ask your father and the elders, the fathers of the nation, what's the right direction and what path you should follow. Also, the prophets are called avot. Because if you would be your biological father, do you know how many people are baalei tshuva and their parents are not even shomer mitzvot? You're going to go and ask your father, he's going to tell you to be gay. It's no problem. I would accept you. Why not? Be with him. I don't like this girl. With parents like today in the world, some parents would encourage you to be a big thief. Some parents will encourage you to be malve beribi to Jews. Some parents will encourage you to marry a non-Jewish girl. Some parents will encourage you to be some kind of a academic, scholar, atheist. Some parents will cut their children out of the wheel just because they want to keep their religion. What advice you can get from such a low-life father? What are you going to ask from him? Every second of his life is rebelling against Hashem. So obviously the Torah doesn't mean ask your biological father. Sometimes your biological father is great. Sometimes it's horrible. That's not what we're talking about. You have to ask Avot Auma, Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, Emunah in Hashem, Chesed, Gvura, Judgment. That's what it means. Now comes the sentence that nobody likes to hear. Vaishman Yeshurun Vaivat. Yeshurun is the nation of Israel. When you call the nation of Israel Israel, and when you call them Yeshurun, which one of the two is a higher status? Israel or Yeshurun? Yeshurun? Yeshurun is the highest title. Highest title. Yeshurun means straight like a ruler. Moshe used this expression twice before he passed. Avdi Yaakov Yishurun Bacharti Bo, that's the words of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 44, verse 2. Moshe is using this expression only twice. Yishurun, the Rebbe Migur, Chidushe Arim, he says it's a higher level of Israel. Why Moshe is using it now before he passed, when he gives Musar to the Jewish nation, he rebukes them. Why do you use a higher title to them? 
The answer is, Moshe wants to tell every one of them, you are right now Yeshurun. You have Torah, you're about to enter Israel, you are on the highest level you can imagine. The highest. You heard the voice of God. You're coming to the land of Israel, you're going to build the Bet HaMikdash. You have a bright future. You should know one thing. If you be an ungrateful person, you become immediately nothing. If you become father, meaning you eat well, you make money, you gain power, what happened to you? You kick the Torah, you kick the halacha, you become ungrateful. Shamanta avita kasita, become father and father, more layers of fat. It's just metaphoric, not literally fat. Meaning in your lifestyle. Only fancy schmancy, don't eat this, don't eat that, don't wear this, don't wear that, I don't drive such a car. Only business class, only that, I need special bed. Everything by him has to be like a king. That's called Vaishman. Now comes another arrow to the heart. Kidor ta'apuchot hema. Ta'apuchot means not stable. One day you're here, one day you're the opposite. One day you're right, one day you're left. One day you're religious, one day you're rasha. Make up your mind what you are. Dor ta'apuchot sote mider chayashar. Off the path. According to what? What's the cause that he goes off the path, left and right? There is a path. One day is falling from the left, one day is falling from the right. But he keeps falling from the right path. Why? What attracts him to go off the path? The answer, desires. Desires. Once you have a desire, you justify it. You're not allowed to be with this girl. David Amelech went with a girl like this. Ah, already jumped to conclusion. You're not allowed to do this. This one did, that one did. Right away, the brain is a lawyer for the desire. The brain is a servant to your will. You have desires, you're desiring things. And immediately you use what you know to justify your evil way. And that's what's written. According to his selfish needs, that's how he determined the truth. For instance, the prophet Yeshaya says, Oi, haomrim lara tov velatov ra. Oi, to those who say that the bad is good and the good is bad. To learn Torah, it's not good. What's going to come out of it? To be a doctor, very good. What's very good about it? You make money, but you'll make money even if you won't be a doctor. It's up to Hashem how much money you make. The job, medical, doesn't bring the money. Even though you are sure that your education brings you the money, it's nonsense. There's a lot of ignorant fool that makes a lot more than a doctor. All these boxers, all these gamblers, all these cash advance people, what exactly they know about medicine? Nothing. Some of them didn't finish 12 years of school. They make a million dollars a month, much more than a doctor. Wisdom does not bring bread, King Solomon said already. So the point is right now, is being a doctor, 99% of your patients are people that fight against God. You have to take care of gays. You have to take care of Nazis. You have to take care of Muslim terrorists. You have to take care of a lot of atheists. You have to take care of a lot of idol worshippers. You have to take care of a lot of big thieves. About, uh, uh, you have to take care of a lot of corrupted people. You have to take care of dirty politicians who because of them people are dying every day. If you look at uh, your hundred clientele, one is righteous, 99% are evil and wicked. And you have to help them to live longer that they should kill more people. But it's a great job to be a doctor. It would be a great job if 99% of your patients would be right, righteous, holy people, and one was wicked. No, we live with the one. But in the world we are today, it's not such a great thing. 
to take care of wicked people who all day speak against God. Think about it. How many doctors thought about it? I say that to one person who wanted to be a doctor, he said, very good, I'm not going to medical school. I never thought about it. I never thought about it. I say that to another girl, she said, I'm going to be a doctor, but I'll make sure to work only with righteous people. So how exactly you make sure? So I'll apply only in a very orthodox area, meaning Borough Park, Lakewood, Muncie. At least I'll take care of religious people. Not that all religious people are righteous. I wish it was the case. But at least you don't have any punishment for helping them. Why? It looks to me like a religious person. How am I supposed to know it's not? He looks like a religious person. Yamaka, tzitzit, beer, knows Torah, comes to my clinic. I take care of him. If in Shamaim I'll find out he was doing things behind the scene, I have no guilt. But if I have to take care of a Hamas terrorist who comes in after last night, he brag on TV how he blow up some people, and I have to help him not to die, that's already a big issue. I have a Nazi, I have to give him a vaccine, he takes off his arm, I see a swastika. I have to help him to live, when knowing that his agenda is to murder half of the people in the world. Is it a mitzvah to help someone like that? Not so much. The idea is, people first wants to go on a job because of the ego and the money. Then they think about the morality of the job. You want to be a criminal lawyer, and who exactly are you going to defend? Rapists, pedophiles, thieves, robbers, murderers. Who are you going to save? 99% of the clientele are people that according to the Torah, they don't have the right to breathe. Hashem is keeping them around for his own reason before he sends them to hell. Now you with your skills just put back a mass murderer back on the street. Who do you think will be held guilty for the next 10 people he will murder? You will have a share in it. But I got paid $300,000 for the case. <laughs> you will regret every dollar you made, you fool. That's the truth, as painful as it is. That's the truth. Everything that comes to the world that is good, you will be rewarded for it. Residual income, forever. And every bad thing, you will be paid for it in a negative way. Meshalem la adam ki prima ala lav. Like the fruit of his actions. Not the actions, the fruits of the action. What will continue later after you die and he will die 20, 30, 50, 100 years later, every Rosh Hashanah. Sifrei Chaim Vemetim Niftachim, Hashem review your case. What you left in the world. That murderer that you released, continue to murder. But I'm already dead for 10 years. Doesn't matter. You have to pay this year for the not, another five people he shot in the head. But I'm already in hell for 10 years. Why are you adding more years to my sentence? Because the person you just released with your lies, knowing he's a murderer, just killed five more people. And if he killed the rabbi, oh, 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 now you have to pay for all the Torah that was prevented in the world because of that. And if the rabbi had few great kids in yeshiva, and because of that they went off the, the, the path because their mother couldn't pay tuition, and in the end they ended up in the street and they died from drugs or they became secular, now you have to pay for every sin they do. Think about it. You wanted to be a criminal lawyer, huh? If they only knew what's waiting for them, these people. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you're already a criminal lawyer, you already became, use it to save Jews from the miserable, corrupted justice system of America or in Israel. Please go defend people that according to Torah, they don't deserve to be punished. People that the governments are after them for all kinds of things. The greedy government wants to take away all their profit. Or because of stock market issues, according to the is nothing illegal. Someone told them, buy this stock, it will go up. And now the FBI wants to torture them and take away everything they have. According to the they did nothing wrong. I'll give you another example. A person 
married a young girl. She's younger than the age. I think the age, what's the age allowed 18? What's the, the youngest age to get married in New York? Without the parents' permission. with the parents' permission. But without the parents' permission? 18. 18. So let's say someone 25 married a girl 17. It's against the law, right? Let's say they caught him. They can prosecute him as like a, like a rape of a little girl. You know, they have these laws. According to the Torah, nothing wrong was done here. Our grandmothers were married at 12 in the previous generation. Moroccan, Syrians, Yemenite, and even some Ashkenazim. Age 12, 13, uh, thousands of women will get married. What's the difference? It's 40, 50 years later today. One generation that is much more spoiled than modern. But according to the Torah, nothing was wrong here. She's 17, she could be a great wife and a great mother. But it's against the law of New York. They want to put him 10 years in prison. Go defend him. Not that I'm for it, don't get me wrong. I'm totally against that girls are young, will get married. Why? Because mentally they're not ready. We live in such a world that girls today, 17, are not what 17 was 40 years ago. It's a different world. That's why there's no rush. I always tell her, what's the rush? Oh, she's already 18. She can wait until 2021. It's not the end of the world. But if it already happened, at least use your skill as a lawyer to go save them. One kid sat in front, next to a friend and the police caught the driver with drugs in his pocket. The other one goes down with him. He was in a car. They arrest him also. Why? Until they find out that he has nothing to do with the drugs. There was drugs in the car. Both of them are getting arrested. This innocent kid, they only got a ride. Now he needs lawyers, pay, I don't know, tens of thousands of dollars to get out of the case. Go help him. I, can, I just give a few examples. If you're already a criminal lawyer, at least use it to do good in the world. Not to defend rapists and pedophiles and murderers and help them to go back that they can hurt more people. <clears throat> and the last thing for today, Rabotai. Dorta Apuchot means a generation that is upside down. One minute is downside up, one minute is upside down. Chazal are telling us that's the nature of the Jewish nation. Israel as Shebaumot. The pure Jews, those who are really Jewish. Not everyone that considers today himself as a Jew is really a Jew. Some are bichlan, not Jewish. Their grandmother wasn't Jewish, so they're not Jewish. They think they are, but they're not. And some, they are officially Jewish, but they are Erev Rav. They are from this group that Moshe converted. Those who are pure Jews, not Erev Rav, not Goim, pure Jewish Neshama. One of their traits is to be an extremist. Jews must be an extremist, for good or for bad. They can't settle in the middle. Either they are the most righteous or they are, they are the worst. Whatever they do, they want to do it all the way to the end. You want to be righteous? It's it never enough for you. How can I be more and more and more? You want to be wicked? There's no end to how wicked you can be. You can destroy the world. As Shebaumot. What? The Gemara says. On one side, Jews can show love and compassion to each other. On the other hand, they're full of fights and separations and divided to different groups with lots of politics and baseless hatred. In one hand, they are the most merciful people in the world, the most generous people when it comes to charity, the most helpful when it comes to act of kindness and helping and saving and having mercy on the poor and on the miserable people. On the other hand, it can be full of jealousy and baseless hatred and competition and Lashon Hara and putting each other down. That's what Rabbi Yehuda bar Eli said in the Gemara in Masechet Megillah, page 16. Umazo, this nation, meaning the Jewish nation, Meshula Le'afar, is compared to the sand <coughs> and to the stars. Just like God said to Abraham. 
your children, in one hand he compared them to the skies, in, to the stars in the sky, and right there he compares them to the sand on the earth. So it says like this, Kesheem Yordim, when they go down, they go to the bottom, which is the sand. That's the bottom of the bottom. When they go up, they can go up all the way to the stars. But there is another reason for it. Why Hashem compare us to the stars and to the, to the sand? Stars are far from each other. One is here, one is there. It's separated. Very far. Each one in his own corner. No unity. Nothing is stuck together. Sometimes this is the way we are. And sometimes like the sand. Everyone attached to the other, like one unit. But even sand, when you pick it up, it separates. Unless it gets wet. Then it becomes a chunk of mud. Water is Torah. And Torah, and Maim El Torah. Every time the Torah compare, the, the Hashem compare the Torah to water. Water always go from the top to the bottom, meaning down to earth. In order for you to be a Chacham, you must be humble. If you're full of ego and show, you never be Tamil Chacham. Impossible. Moshe was the master of the Torah because he was the most humble. So water are always going to the lowest. Why? That's the only way to gain Torah. The water are always gathering in the lowest place. But the water that touch the sand, attach the sand like glue. Then you pick up a whole chunk. It doesn't separate. You can put it together and throw it, and here it still stay like a chunk, like a meatball. Why? When the Jewish nation is into Torah, water, the water makes unity. No one is jealous with each other. Everyone knows Hashem knows what he's doing. Everyone gets the right parnasah. Hashem gives everyone what they deserve. What's the point of having hate, racism, all this nonsense? All this comes from lack of, of knowledge, for no learning. How can you be racist against another child of Hashem, you fool? Why are you hating? Because his skin is lighter or darker or because he has different accent or he was born in a different part of the planet? Stop it. It's the Satan instigate. Look at them. They are like this. Look at them. Look at him. Look at her. Stuyot. Every one of these people, you put them in Yom Kippur one hour before the end in Eila. Then do you think it's fair to be racist? It's absolutely not. Now it's the key moment. The end, the final judgment. Say to Hashem that justify that you are a racist. Tell him, tell him. I hate Sfaradim, I hate Ashkenazim, I hate this, I hate Moroccans, I hate the Manim. Say it to Hashem. Say that it's fair that you are like this. No, can't. Why? Because you know it's wrong. Two hours after Yom Kippur, he's back to his bad habits. But obviously, a normal person knows that it's a terrible thing. You hate people because they are wicked and they hate Hashem? It's mitzvah to hate them. You hate people because of the color of the skin? You are a criminal. Both times you hate someone. One time you're loud, one time it's a sin. You hate righteous people. That's a very big sin. How can you hate a righteous person? He dedicates his life that, that Hashem loves him so much. You hate him, it's like you hate Hashem. Imagine if someone has few kids and the kid that he loved the most, you constantly hate and, and bother. What does it show? That you disrespect the father. If you see the father love that kid so much, why would you go against him? The fact that you go against the child shows they have zero respect to the father. Then ask the, the Arabs why they care so much about the Jews and they want to always hurt them. Some of them, not all. Why? You come to the mosque, you pray five times. Why? That God killed the Jews. Six. What's going on with you? Don't you see in the books that God loves the Jews? They're going to have excuses. By the way, some of their excuse, excuses are accurate. When they come and speak about the wicked liberal Jews that spread 
immorality in the world, what can we say? If an Arab will come and speak against the gay parade that comes to Jerusalem, is right or wrong? It's 100% right. One time the head of the Hamas said to the Israeli Arabs, how can you be quiet and let these filthy gays coming into Jerusalem and you do nothing about it? The Arab Hamas, probably a mass murderer, terrorist, said to the Israeli Arabs, how do you let them come to the holy city of Jerusalem? If the Jews do nothing about it, but how you, the believers in, in Allah, you should go and fight them. I was hoping maybe the Arabs will wake up. <laughs> but they didn't. The Israeli Arabs already are modern. Enjoy the good life. Ma, I'm going to go to Jerusalem with signs and scream, shame on you, don't come to the holy city. But the fact that an Arab terrorist actually gave a speech about it, that he doesn't understand how believers in God let these filthy gays come to the holy city of Jerusalem and they do nothing about it, that's the biggest shame to every Jew on earth. The biggest shame should hide for a month under the ground that someone who wants to kill children and women on the street has more morality than us. He is disgusted by their behaving against Hashem and we are not. At least most of us. Ah, it's not my problem. Sure it's your problem. Torah says, You have to do everything you can to prevent it. You fail, you fail. But I thought you said if you have an unan that Hashem will give everybody the fair judgment, it's not our place to... to, to Good, excellent question, but the answer is even better. Everyone for sure will get what they deserve. But if people come to burn the synagogue, we have to let them burn it and hope that later they'll be punished? Or if we can prevent it right now, we have all obligation to prevent it. What do you think? Of course, prevent, prevent it. But it may be by going to stop the gay parade, you're going to cause more attention. Look at the dirty Jews that are against the homos. And we didn't say to stop it by violence or to shoot or to, you know, no, we're not terrorists. To stop it means it's enough you put 10,000 people in the entrance and they stand over there and they see there's 10,000 people waiting, religious people, and we cannot go through, that's it. The police, you know, they're always going to stop between you and them. They demonstrate, you demonstrate. The police will stop once, twice, three times. They will stop it. You understand? Right now, they know nobody, make, nobody does anything. They can do whatever, they, can do whatever they want. But the point, the point that I'm saying is, someone come to kill my children, the Torah says, someone who comes to kill you, kill him first. You say, oh, let him kill them. And then Hashem will give them what they deserve. That's not how it works. Oh, right now I don't have parnasa, I don't have a job, I don't, I don't have money. Sit home until you starve to death. It's not your problem, it's Hashem's problem. No, the Torah says, I will bless you in what you do. Go and try to make yourself some money. You don't know how to work. Collect tzedakah. Come to the rich, have mercy on me. I'm, uh, I'm unable to make money right now. Seek. This, that, I'm looking for a job, I can't find. Can you help me out? Okay, but you have to do something. Who will feed you? What do you want, Hashem, to come into your house and cook soup for you? The idea in life, you have to make an effort. And especially when people declare a war against Hashem, that's when you have to show that you're willing to sacrifice the most. When it comes to your personal life, you have to make an effort. When it comes to Hashem on air, the effort has to be a thousand times greater. If they come to steal my money, I'm trying to prevent it. But if they stole, they stole. Not, not the end of the world. I'm still alive, Baruch Hashem. But if they come to burn the Torah, for that I'm willing to die for it. For my money, I'm not willing to die. For my new job, I'm willing to let it go. For my uh, honor, I'm willing to have some insults, no problem. But when it comes to Hashem, there's no permission to compromise. Someone wants to burn the shul, you have to give everything you can to prevent it. Someone wants to burn the Torah, 
someone wants to close the yeshiva, we have to show Hashem we care. That's, by the way, one of the ways that Hashem judges us. That's why I've been saying to people for years, the way to prove Hashem you really love Him, it's to donate a lot of money to Kiru, to what we do here. Shaking up people, waking up people, giving them all kinds of videos and USBs and books, turn them into more religious people. The fact that more and more people begin to hear and they change, that's the best way to prove to Hashem that we love Him. Because there's nothing that makes the father happier than you save his children. Nothing. If the, if the son of the king is drowning in a lake, and you jump with your expensive suit and took him out and saved his life, I don't have to tell you from now on that you are a super VIP in the house of the king. Anything you ever have, the king will always run out of his way to help you. Why? You just saved his son. Imagine if you would lose his son. He owes you the world. Who doesn't want to be the most favorite Jew or non-Jew in the eyes of God? Who wouldn't want it? Ask every Jew, normal one, forget about this Erev Rav, the decent one. I have here a ticket. What is it? A VIP by Hashem. You can have it. How much? Thousand dollars a month. And you, the king of the world. You are one of the few people that Hashem wrote you in his VIP notebook. This person and this and him and her and, and, and him, I love the most in the world. How much? A thousand dollars a month. What's the thousand? To save his children. For that he gives you this VIP. You know one normal person who wouldn't grab it? Even unemployed people who barely can put bread on their on table would run and collect dollar dollar just for that. Because, but it's written. That someone that saves Hashem children is the most loved person in the eyes of Hashem. It's guaranteed. Nothing is greater than that. But people are not getting the point. They invest in such nonsense. Such nonsense. And in the end, they're not going to do the right thing. It's hard to believe. You know, the things, some people are generous. They're willing to invest. But when they finally write the check, always to the worst cause. Always. Why? They don't see, they don't, they don't have the schut. So, Abutai, Hashem say, I will shoot my arrows at them. When we are wicked, <coughs> We have a lot of arrows. One arrow called Hamas, the other one Hezbollah, the other one Iran, the other one the Erev Rav. A lot of arrows. Biden. But you know, Biden, Hussein Obama. But you know what the problem is? That many people don't pay attention to the language of the verse. Chitzai, achalebam. Achale means until the last arrow. The last arrow is used, meaning I won't have in my arsenal now one arrow left, Hashem says. I will use all my weapon against them. Against who? Against the Jews. Against us. It's very scary. Who says that? Hashem. Rashi writes. Rashi brings Chazal, speaks about it in Gemara in Masechet Sota, page 9. This curse, this curse, it's also a blessing. Why? The curse is that Hashem is going to shoot a lot of missiles at us, or arrows, until the last final one. That's the curse. Where is the blessing? that all the arrows would end and the Jewish nation will still remain. <laughs> Meaning as much as I hit them, no one can wipe them out from the face of the earth. No one, not the empires, not this arrow, not the Romans. Not, every one of them is an arrow. The Romans, the Greeks, the Persians, the Babylonians, the Arabs, the, you know, Iran now. No matter how many arrows I'll shoot at them, 
there will always rise back. Why? Because I swore to Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, I can never, ever finish them up. Never. And I will never replace them with another nation. The Chachamim says, Hashem put us in the hand of the nations to torture us in order for us to repent. For instance, the prophet Isaiah called Ashur, the nation of Ashur. How do you say Ashur in English? Assyria. Assyria. Assyria? Assyria. Assyria, the prophet called him Shevet Api, the whip. You know the whip that you hit someone? Hashem called them my whip, meaning this is the whip that I use to hit my children. And uh, the, 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 the beating that we take makes us weaker, but will not wipe us out. It makes us weaker, yes, but it makes us weak, we repent, we jump back up, and so forth and so on. I finish last minute. Moshe says, Azinu Hashemayim, Vatishma Aretz. The prophet Yeshaya said the opposite. Shimu shamayim v'azini aritz. What's the difference between Moshe, Prophet Moshe, and Prophet Isaiah? Moshe was already in shamayim, the highest level. So he's close to the heaven. When you're close, you say azini. La'azini, it's from close. To hear, it's from far. Vatishma aritz, because Moshe in the heaven, and the, the earth is very far, so he's saying... Ta'azini shamayim v'tishma aretz. The prophet Yeshaya is on the earth. It's not in shamayim. He's in the earth, so what does he say? The opposite language. Shimu shamayim. The heaven should hear from far. Ta'azini aretz. And the earth should listen. Why? Because I'm on the earth. I'm close to the earth. The same thing when we have in the Torah that lirot and mashkif. What's the difference between ro'e and mashkif? Ro'e is from cloth. Jose means into the future, Jose. Ro'e, it's right now. You're in front of me and I look at you. Mashkif, it's from far, like, like you have binoculars and you mishkefet, it's called mishkefet. Why it's called mishkefet? Because you mashkif from far away. And what does it say in the Pasuk? Mishamayim, right? Mashkif Hashem on the people on the earth. From heaven, Hashem is watching. But there is, a, there is another expression. What does it mean? Lirot! Ayesh maskil doresh el Hashem. From heavens, Hashem is looking at us from far, reviewing us, searching for the right educated person. And the verse define who is an educated person. He did not say someone who graduated Harvard or the Hebrew University or Columbia or Yale or MIT or all of those fancy schmancy colleges. He didn't say someone was a great Air Force pilot in Israeli Air Force. It doesn't say scientist. It doesn't say doctors. It doesn't say lawyers. It does define who is an educated person. Maskil, askala, educated. Who? Educated equal. Doresh el Hashem. Searching for God constantly. That's the definition. Searching for God in every detail. This baby was born like that, that one like that, this happened, the bomb fell here and not here, this person died, this person just got saved. 
you're not always going to find a reason. Most of the time you won't know why Hashem does what He does. Sometimes you can guess. It's a pretty easy guess. Right? For instance, in the, when Saddam Hussein shot 60 Scuds missiles, 21 fell in the ocean, 39 fell on Israel. Why 39? People who know Torah know 39 restrictions of Shabbat. The number is a little bit too obvious. And who died? Only one person. No one died from direct, uh, direct contact with a missile. No one. Building fell down, no one died. 39 Scott missiles bigger than the synagogue, each one. Huge. Signs of an airplane. Fell on the land of Israel. What year? Nobody died. He's asking what year was it. What year was that? 91. 91. 91. 91. Ended on 4. He called 4. Saddam Hussein, George Bush, the father, was the head of the coalition against Saddam Hussein, invaded Kuwait. Yeah. It's 30 something years now, 32 years. Late 90, early 91. So, listen to this. 39 Scuds missile fans in Israel, now one person died. Except one who died from a heart attack. <laughs> and who was that one? Someone who came to Bnei Brak every Friday night with a motorcycle, with a stereo system in the back, with big speaker, playing loud music to disturb the religious Haredim in Bnei Brak. Until one person even got him into Rav Chaim Kanievsky, who asked him to stop. And in the end he told him, if you will continue what you are doing, you're going to deal with the consequences of it. And the only person who died in a Gulf War in Israel was this Rasha Merusha. And he didn't die from the missile. He died from the panic. He got scared. Why? He would get the religious people scared. Loud music all of a sudden, full volume. They get very scared. Hashem did the same to him. Boom! The bomb explodes very loud, like his music, and killed him. <laughs> so we know why he died. Can we sign guarantee? No. Maybe there's other reasons also. We don't know. Can we swear on our life? No. Most likely that's the reason. But most of the time we won't know. We won't know. But we are obligated to search. To keep our mind busy. Why, why, this, that? By the way, why am I deserving it? Why Hashem gave me this gift? What have I done to earn it? You begin to think, oh, I remember a few years ago I did the same thing to that person. It's Mida Keneged Mida. Why am I getting punished? Why exactly like this way? I'm not guilty. I know I'm not guilty. Ah, I did the same thing to an innocent person back then. Why I lost this exact amount of money? Searching. Oh, I owe that money to that guy. It's Mishamai. Maybe you're wrong. I will finish with a good story, you know, to break the ice a little bit. You know, next week there's no shiur, and also the following week is Yom Tov. We'll be back after the holiday. But uh, I want to tell you a story. You know, when I go to Israel to give speeches, I have my assistant. He's with me for 10 years, since I started to give lectures on trips to Israel, he's with me from day one. He is actually the cause that convinced me to start giving lectures in Israel. Why? His father passed, he wanted someone for the yard side, he loved me very much. So I'm going to buy you a ticket, can you come to my father's yard side? So I say, you know what, anyway I may have reasons to go to Israel, let me go. And that's how it started. So that he's organized, bought microphone, speaker, he knows about things, he got, you know, put flyers. So from then on he said, why, why don't I just help you now and we start making a lot of lectures. We did hundreds of lectures since then. So when, there, there used to be time, a few years ago, not anymore, there was a period of about maybe two or three trips. There is a tzaddik named Yoel, he lives in Ranana, one of my ballet tshuva. He came up with an idea to make a boot made out from papers, like carbon papers, with my picture. And right, the biggest mitzvah to save souls, he has a jar. Everyone who comes into the lecture puts daka. 
uh, nobody tells you how much to put. We used that money back then, CDs were very popular. We bought almost two million CDs from China. We, we gave all over Israel, made many, many thousands of Bale Tshuva. But that's how some of the money we paid from those people put 100 shekel, 50 shekel. Some people put coins, shekel, two shekel, five shekel, 10 shekel, you know, half a shekel. Everyone, whatever they have in the pocket. So the, 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 the paper money, it's easy to use, it's not heavy. What are you gonna do now? We have 50 coins there, whatever, you know. You need to replace it with paper. So what would we do with that? Either we paid it in a gas station, but they give us attitude. The guys have to stand at 2 a.m. at night and counting the coin. I didn't want to upset the people in the gas station. I say, you know what? There's only one solution. We go to eat. I'm very hungry. Now 1, 2 a.m. We have to wear the place in Hulon, the good Ashgacha. We go, they sell sandwiches. So now on the way, I, so I count all the coins. You know, I came to 80 something shekel and whatever. I know the number now, it's all in a, in a paper cup. I go into the place with the sandwiches. I say to the guy, this sandwich, that sandwich, this drink, that drink, that, extra this. So the guy is a Russian guy, probably not Jewish. And another Israeli guy next to him, they walk on the counter. Remember, this is after 1 a.m. at night. And the place has a lot of young people there. It's packed, 1, 1 a.m., it's my a lot of people there. The guy say, I, now I count, I know exactly how much I have in a, in a cup. Now I pull it into my hands. I'm holding a big pile of uh, maybe say 60, 70 coins. Guy added all up, 89 shekel and 50 something uh, agurot. I say, here. <laughs> I say, what? Exactly what you ask. No, it cannot be. Count. <laughs> Everybody got the attention. Cannot be. So count. The guy counts. Exactly. No. What are the odds? How many coins were there? Whatever it came out to was exactly to the cent. Not one cent more, not one cent. If it would be one shekel less, and also I'm very impressive. One shekel more, also very, even five shekel more, it's very impressive. It's exactly to the point, exactly what we got. Here, the guy, and the guy, I never saw in my life such thing. The next time we came was on my next trip. The guy already knew who I am. Oh, you're the one with the coins. Who knows how many months they've been speaking about this, this Chilonim. You understand? Why Hashem gives us these little miracles? If it would be more or less, I would add, it's no big deal, or get some back. It's not about the coins. It's about to show you every little thing is supervised. I wanted to get your attention now. For good, for bad, akol tachat ashgacha. Baruch Adonai le'olam, amen ve'amen. Rabbi Hanania ben Akashia, amen. Ratzah, kadosh b'chul, ezah.